Coming up on this episode of the Hockey Nuts, Steve and I get you caught up with all of the news of the past week around the hockey world. Bye weeks are over, so the schedule's getting busy again on the ice. There were some injuries this week to some very key players for their respective teams, and an Ironman streak came to an end in a controversial manner. We'll have the details of all this, plus the Minor League Hockey Minute, the NCAA Hockey Minute, and our picks of the week coming up next. This is the Hockey Nuts Podcast, Season 2, Episode 22, recorded on Friday, January 19th, 2017. Can Vegas actually win the Stanley Cup? Shut up and sit down. Christian Chus for Brett Connolly for the front Lars Eller Carlson. Broken up by Stepniak. He scored. No, they don't. It stays out. It ricocheted around and stayed out. Along the boards now, Tom Wilson. To the open corner. A flurry will get to it. Carolina back out to neutralize. Here's Skinner. At his side, Lucas Walmart. Skinner's right in. His shot scores! Jeff Skinner! Goes top cheese on Philip Grubauer. Carolina has a 3-2 lead. McDonough. Buffalo goal is third of the season. A power play goal is scored by the crowd. Quiet is the line in. The goal long pass. Nash tipped it over to Spanajan. He's stopped by Ristolina. The goal 14 minutes, 59 on the boards. Nash takes it away. Zibanejad fakes. Zibanejad in front. Score! Pavel Buchnevich gives the Rangers a 4 3 lead. Pretty straight forward. Comes down his right hand side as a right handed shooter. Just never really got to the opening. Alex Galchenyuk, a 30 goal scorer two years ago. Deeks and Rask makes a great move across the goal line to deny him. Galchenyuk, a strong move to the backhand. And a stronger move by Rask. Able to get a good hard push. Not only powerful, but quick to get over there and extend that left arm, left leg. Brad Marchand winds it up with speed. Going at Carey Price. He scores! The Bruins win! 12 games in a row with at least a point. 9-0-3. Their longest streak since they charged through to the President's Trophy in March of 2014 when they went 16 straight. Hello and welcome to Season 2, Episode 22 of the Hockey Nuts Podcast. My name is Wayne Halley. I'm here with Steve Ball. Once again, Steve, how's it going tonight? I'm doing good, Wayne. Good to be with you tonight. All right. We're recording here again on Friday night. Seems to be seems to be starting to be our normal night around here. Because <laughs> neither one of us seem to have time during the week anymore to get it done until uh, Friday night. So here we are, Friday night, once again, recording our next episode of the Hockey Nuts Podcast. So uh, anyway, uh, what well, we do last week, we did it on Friday night as well. So we're exactly a week out. So we got about a week's worth of stuff to get caught up on. And uh, of course, this past week was the second of two weeks for most NHL teams on or as far as the NHL bye weeks are concerned. So we had another light week around the, the uh, schedule on the ice. But off the ice, again, it was a very busy week. And we've got some stuff. And uh, we've got some stuff that affected uh, one of our teams this week. So oh, yeah. let's uh, get started. But before we do, um, I really want to open the show with uh, talking about Vegas. Because as we sit here tonight, they are... Well, first of all, they played... Tampa Bay last night in a matchup of number one versus number two in the league in terms of points. And Vegas blew Tampa Bay out of the water last night. It was a 4-1 game. And uh, it was in it was in Tampa. So a home game for Tampa and they and they couldn't beat Vegas. Um, 
So now Vegas is just two points back of ta- of Tampa for yep. the for the top spot in the NHL. Vegas plays again tonight. So you know what that means? And because of the fact that Vegas has beat Tampa twice this year, they hold the tie break against Tampa. That means yep. with a win tonight, the Vegas Golden Knights will be the number one team in the NHL. How it's strange does that sound? <laughs> absolutely incredible. Um and I, 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 I mean, and and they would be the number one team in the NHL, and we're pushing February. I mean, uh, that that's what's. Re- I could see it in early January. You know, I mean, you could see something like that in the first ten games of the season. But this, this is really. I, I don't know what to say. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm really at a loss for words. And uh, if someone would, I, I mean, we we played them last. You, as you know. Yep. We played them recently uh, in in Vegas, and uh, and actually had a darn good chance of winning that game, uh, but uh, but lost in uh, you know in the in the third period really. Yep. So, uh, but you know what? I, you, know, you know what? Everybody's playing that kind of game against Vegas. That's that's the thing with them. It's. The game is close, going right to the end of the game, and then and then Boom. something happens at the at the end. Almost every single game, Vegas either has comes back and wins the game, or they tie the game late and win it in overtime, or the game stays tied going into overtime and Vegas wins it. Or you know it, that's just the way they've been all we, all year long. They're just hang around, hang around, hang around, and, and then Vegas comes up and and bites them, and it's 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 just yeah. amazing to watch. Right. And, and with that in mind, it's almost surreal. Yeah. Yeah. It's all surreal. Yep. Um, yeah. It's just, uh, and they're a fun team to watch. They're, I mean, I've been watching a lot of their games in recent weeks and months, and, and it's just, um, it, it's a fun team to watch. The energy that they play with is just, is unmatched by just about any, everybody else in the league. Right. They just play with so much intensity. They don't give up, and they, uh, it's just, they wear teams out is, is just essentially the way they play is is the intensity that that goes from the puck drop in the first period all the way till the final buzzer and they right. just don't stop skating they don't stop they outwork every team they play and that's just that's their game and and they're right. doing it they're just they're on the cusp of being the number 1 team in the NHL here on January 19th right well over halfway point you know halfway through the season we're almost at the All Star break, and here they are at the top of the standings. Yeah, it's just it's it's amazing to see, and nobody and if you if you say that you said that they would be the number one team in January back at the beginning of the year, number one, you're lying. Yeah. <laughs> number, and number two, nobody would believe you. So well, that's but, right. But here they are, and guess what? Yeah. After they finish with Florida tonight, they jump on a plane and they fly to Raleigh. Wow! And they play Carolina on Sunday. And I am going to do everything I can to make it to that game. I've got Sunday off. I've got to make a quick trip up to Boone to drop off some stuff at my daughter's dorm, and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to try to make it to that game. Wow, that is <laughs> uh, that's a long day, but that also will be an amazing day if you get tickets to that game. Yep. Um, well, it's not a question of if the tickets are available. It's it's just uh, whether or not I can get back in time to go. So, um, and the tickets are actually aren't that bad. I I looked on SeatGeek a few days ago, and they were you could get tickets to that game for twenty something dollars. I don't know what it is right now. Yeah, twenty three dollars if you want to sit up high. Amazing. Yep. So what are you doing Sunday, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah, I think it'll be a fun game to go see. But yeah, twenty twenty three dollars is the. In- Incredible! It's the lowest the price that's available. In the NHL section section three hundred eight. We can see the hottest team in the NHL. Amazing coming up, and they'll be here all weekend. They get here tonight after the game. They generally fly out, so I'm assuming they're flying out out of Florida tonight. So they'll be spending the entire day here tomorrow. They'll probably have practice at PNC tomorrow at some point. Yeah, truly amazing. Yep, truly amazing. All right, well, let's get started with the rest of our podcast and follow the uh, format we've done and always first and foremost is we talk about our teams yep. and I don't know who do you want to start with this week <laughs> you want to start with the Rangers tonight let's start with the Rangers tonight we'll start with the Rangers and we'll talk about um I, I think I think what's what's a good way to start this Wayne is just just to say that uh the Rangers really for quite some time uh up until one game this week they just they just haven't played well uh, they didn't play well in the Winter Classic for the whole game. They played a partial game here and there. They and they they've been on the ice. They played well. 
Um, but they haven't played consistently well, and I don't know what it is. I, I, I know that the game against the New York Islanders last Saturday was just, if you don't think that Matt Barzell is uh, the leading candidate for the Calder Trophy, I'd like to, I mean, I could see a case being made for Brock Besser, but it's one of those two. I mean, he, he played an incredible game and I, you know, there, you could make an argument that he is playing better all around right now than John Tavares is if they lost Barzell right now, they'd be in, they'd be hurting the Islanders. They'd be hurting big time. And they've been playing inconsistent as well, too. So they have. They've had the, they've had their own struggles. But they didn't play inconsistent in that game. They beat the pants off a of 7-2. And uh, he, uh, that was really, I mean, we were never in that game. It was a ass whooping. Yep. So um, that started out the week. And, of course, I wasn't very happy the next night either. We were ahead 2-1 to one and lost 5-2 to two to Pittsburgh uh, in a game that looked like we were starting out to, to come back and play very well in. And then fell off, and, and of course, in, you know, when you're chasing the game in Pittsburgh, that's that's the worst place to chase a game in. Yeah. And they came back and beat us 5-2. Well, that's a rough uh, way to come out of your break. <laughs> oh, yeah. With two and, quick and, you losses. Know, I, didn't expect, I didn't expect with these four games we were playing, I didn't expect to win all four of them at all. But I was hoping to, to pick up three wins. Yeah. Well, that went by the wayside. And then – you know, we had we had uh, we had the day off and went into the third game in a four night stint against the Flyers and really never looked back in that game. That was an we played great hockey in that game. Uh, and I, I thought, OK, well, whatever happened, you know, it's out of their system and they're, they'll get back. And here we are against one of our arch rivals. And really beat the, beat them soundly, five to two. And we get to the game last night against the Buffalo Sabers, and we score, and we're playing great in the first period, and then Buffalo ties it, and then we score again, and it seems like we're getting back. The momentum keeps, and then Buffalo ties it, and they're off. Some of them are off stupid mistakes, penalties, things that are costly. Um, we took a three to two lead, and then Buffalo tied it, uh, and then finally scored at the end of the game uh, to win that game four to three. But a very hard fought, contested game by the Sabers, and I really thought, you know, it seems like the Rangers just let them hang around. That's a team you want to put away, right? <clears throat> uh, well said, and uh, so I, as I said, I, uh, and of course we're suffering from from. You know, and we'll get to it a little bit later on. We're suffering. You know, we lost Kreider. We didn't have um, uh, Kevin Hayes in that game. We don't have Mark Stahl. He's out. So we're we're suffering some some becoming major injury problems. But uh, you find a way to adapt. You at least win games against the worst team in the Eastern Conference. Uh, you know, and we did win last night. But I, I you know, I, I don't think Elaine Vigneault can be happy at all with that win. So, um, the, and, and, you know, we'll get into it a little bit further here. I mean, you know, there, there, it was announced today, there's a major injury to our team, uh, and Kevin Shattenkirk and whether or not he's back this year in the regular season, we don't know. But, uh, I, I immediately got the Twitter feed hitting my cell phone from Rangers, uh, fans all over. And there, there's a lot of them, a lot of them. That still want to see Elaine Vigneault fired, <laughs> and you know New York's like Boston and, yep, and, and yep. Montreal. You you got a ton of negative fans. I wish they'd just go pull for the team they really want to root for, whether it's the Islanders or the Devils or whatever. Just just you know quit pulling for the Rangers. Don't watch them anymore. Go watch a team that makes you happy rather <laughs> yeah. than negative and sad. You know. Yeah, Bo- Boston's got the their Rangers. share their share of negative Nellies as well. Hey, well you know, I don't want fans. I don't want to talk to fans like that because they're not fans. But they're calling for his head because he knew that Shattenkirk was hurt back in September and made comments about his play during the season. And for that reason, he needs to be fired. It's because they all think they can they can coach the team better than AV. So oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> they can step on the ice or get behind the bench and coach the team better than he can. Yep. Um, you know, they, it, like he's wearing ice skates and should be on the <laughs> ice making the team win each time. Yep. But I, I don't know. It, it, it's it's it, it, I, I'm sitting here myself and I'm not being 100 percent positive about the team. But I, I'm I'm just this team, I think, is one of the 16 best teams in the NHL. 
I think they deserve to be in the playoffs. Whether we make it or not, I don't know. But yeah, they're in a tough division. S- they're in a tough division. They're in a tough situation right now, injury wise, to major players on their team. Uh, they're not playing consistently. But you know, I still am going to say I think they're one of the best teams and make the playoffs. Uh, are they going to win the Metropolitan Division? Probably not. But uh, I'm not sitting here worried about it or calling for Alain Vigneault's head because the team isn't playing well. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's how I feel about it. I, I We've got a very tough February coming up and end of this month uh, with a four-game road trip uh, out west. But I'm still optimistic. I'm yeah, st- you, got I still, some, <laughs> you got some late nights ahead of you if you're going to try to watch yeah. those games. <laughs> and Rick Nash, Rick Nash, it is true. Rick Nash is playing great right now, yep. you know. So uh, if Rick Nash is on his game and and scores 35, he's got 13, 14 goals now. If he scores 35 goals this year, 40 goals, I, I think we make it hands down. Yep. So be optimistic about our, our team, you know. That's all I'm saying. Anyways, I went, I went on a little bit too long there, Wayne, but that's how <laughs> that's that's the Rangers in a nutshell in the last week. Yeah, kind of an up and down week for them. Well, let's talk about the Hurricanes next. They're a local team, of course, uh, as everybody knows. And uh, last week we had talked about the home and home with the Capitals. Uh, Of course, as of the recording time, they had won the first game three to one. Well, on the second night, this is a true home and home, two games, two nights in opposite buildings. They played the Capitals at home and Washington ended up beating them in that game four to three. And then on Sunday, Calgary came into Carolina and beat them four to one. And Carolina just looked lackluster in that game. They just looked like they looked like they didn't want to be there in that Calgary game. Uh, at least the Washington game, there was a lot of effort there. I think Carolina should have won that game or could have easily won that game, but. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, Washington ended up just getting the be- better of the bounces and, and came away with the two points in that one. So the Carolina Hurricanes uh, limped into their five-day break with two straight losses, one to the Capitals, one to the uh, the Flames. Right. And they've been off since then. So they had the 15th through the 19th off. So they get back on the ice tomorrow at Detroit, uh, 7 o'clock game there in Detroit. And then, of course, they fly back home uh, the next night and play the Vegas Golden Knights, a game that I'm hoping to go f- go to see, um, uh, assuming I can get back from Boone <laughs> early, <laughs> early enough yeah. from... Uh, early enough in the day to get to that game, but I really want to go see the Vegas Golden Knights play. So, um, so we'll we'll do our best to go see that game anyway. So, um, yeah, so quiet week for the Hurricanes. They and as officially, as far as our podcast is, is concerned, they had an zero and two week. Um, question marks there again. Uh, goaltending has been a bit of an issue uh, once again, or just overall team defense. Uh, but the the biggest problem with the Calgary game was just uh, overall. Just I don't know. Lack of effort is the right way. They just they just uh, they didn't, didn't see the same Carolina team that we had seen in in recent weeks and months. Mm-hmm. So um, I don't know. Let's hope that the five day break will do them some good and they come back out on the ice uh, ready to go and flying because uh, they don't really have a whole lot of injuries. Although they did suffer one in the Calgary game to uh, Sebastian Ajo which we'll talk about later in the uh, show. All right. Well, that's pretty much it with the Hurricanes. Let's talk about the Bruins. Uh, And they have continued to play extremely well. Yes. Uh, Going back to the beginning of the week. uh, Of course, they had their five-day break from the 8th to the 12th. So they came back on the ice on Saturday the 13th at Montreal. And they ended up winning that game four to three in a shootout. A very fun game to watch. It, that that game went back and forth. It could have gone either way. Uh, but uh, but Boston is beginning to for a, for a while there for a few seasons since their cup year when they were beating Montreal on a fairly regular basis. After that, once the reins of the gold de- of the net got turned over from Tim Thomas over to Tuka Ras pretty much permanently after that. Uh, Boston began struggling against Montreal, and they, for whatever reason, Montreal's had their number for a number of seasons, uh, but this year seems to be a little bit different. Uh, first of all, this meeting with the Canadiens on the 13th was the first game against them this season, so it was a, mm-hmm. it, it was officially the first game that Claude Julien uh, coached against his former team, but he got fired almost a year ago, calendar-wise, right. <laughs> so... 
So yeah. a lot of time passed there, and I think that might yeah. might have helped the Bruins. The Bruins have been playing well this season. They're playing confidently. They probably went into Montreal and just said, look, you know, what's in the past is in the past. We're a confident team. We're, we're playing well. We're just going to treat Montreal like any other team and not our biggest rival. And they did. They put up put together a pretty solid win. Uh, it took uh, going all the way to the shootout to get it. So they ended up giving Montreal a point in that game, but they ultimately got the win on that one. Uh, the next game, Dallas uh, against Boston in a rare Monday matinee game. Of course, Monday was Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Um, I got home from work to catch the very tail end of that game. It was uh, two to two late in the third when I uh, turned on the game, and I ended up watching that last five minutes or so of the third, and then the overtime period, of course. And I was a bit perturbed in that one because uh, what essentially gave Dallas the game was Boston got a penalty, um, and it really the 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 penalty never got served. Referee put his arm up. It was a hit behind the net. I didn't think it was it was anything more than a hit, but I don't know if they were going to call a hook or a check from behind. We never even found out, or I never went back and looked to see what the penalty was, because essentially, mm-hmm. what you know, what always happens: referee puts his arm up to signal the delayed penalty. The 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 other team pulls their goalie because they know as soon as the team that did it uh, touches up, the whistle blows. So you can pull your goalie essentially for free. Well, Dallas right. ended up scoring before they even um, before they even uh, blew the whistle for the penalty. So, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, whatever it was, I didn't think that it warranted a call there. But you know, what do we know? We're not <laughs> NHL referees, <laughs> so I was a little pissed about that one. But anyway, Boston got another point out of that one, and then the next couple nights later, uh, they played Montreal. And pretty much beat them start to finish. It wasn't, you know, Montreal just didn't have much effort in that game. Uh, in fact, there's been a lot of press ever since that game where Montreal's not showing any effort. They're not showing, uh, you know, uh, uh, the desperation that they need to have being the, the spot in the standings that they're in. And, um, you know, there's a lot of questioning going on there in Montreal uh, at at you know, at the the members of this team and, and to some extent the management of the team. So uh so Boston beat them pretty soundly there in that game. Um not really a whole lot to talk about. Bergeron got another hat trick in that game, so he's been on fire lately. Um and other than that, you know, it's just a sound the whole team has been on fire. Yeah, it's been a sound win there. And then the next night they went into New York and beat the Islanders much in the same fashion that they beat Montreal. It was just an overall great effort, start to finish. Um, they Bruins exposed some weaknesses that the Islanders have in net and on defense and ended up winning that game five to two. So Boston got a total of six points out of a possible eight on the week. And they are now sitting uh, 15 straight games without a regulation loss. The Bruins are. And I saw a graphic late last night before I went to, to bed in the last 26 games. This amazed me because I knew the Bruins had been playing well, but I didn't think they were playing that well. In the last 26 games, so if you take a 26-game uh, comparison between the Bruins and the rest of the league, all the other teams in the league, just in the last 26 games, basically, why that number? Probably that's when the Bruins started playing well, when they stopped playing 50-50 hockey, where they win one, lose one. Uh, the Bruins have 19-3-4 and four in those last 26 games. That's tied for first in the league. Uh, that record has earned them 42 points, which is actually first in the NHL. In that span, they've scored 3.54 goals per game, which is best in the NHL. And they've allowed 2.02 goals against per game, which is also first in the NHL. Wow. So, very, very good. So, yeah, they're on fire, and I'm excited about it. I can't. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I got to tell you. Tuca's playing well. The young players that they've got coming, you know, that are that are uh, essentially, I mean, the team's got a whole line plus full of rookies, and they're all right. playing well. They're all playing amazingly yeah. well. The top line of Bergeron, Pasternak, and and uh, Marchand is is probably arguably one of the best in the league right now in in terms of production, and it's just they're they're firing on all cylinders right now. Right now, the only worry I have is I just hope they're not peaking too early. That's the only thing. Right, right. <laughs> well, you never, you, yeah, you can never, and, and you're looking at Tampa Bay right now, who's at 65 points, and they're not playing too well in their last 10. But they've been on top of the whole thing 
Yep. Practically for two, two, two solid months now, yep. uh, you know, so. And they're within shouting distance of Tampa Bay. They're not far back from them. No, uh, they're in not. Fact, in fact, they're closer to Tampa Bay points wise than they are uh, to Toronto, who's directly behind them in the standings. Yeah. Well, I mean, my, my point being that, uh, you know, um, it's hard to maintain the level of play that Tampa Bay had going on there for week after week after week after week. They were just month after month. Um, it's hard to do. Yep. So, uh, you know, you, you it, confidence is a lot of it. But when you lose and then you win and then you lose a couple more, it, it doesn't take much. Nope. And uh, and all of a sudden, then you're starting to think twice about things uh, rather than one guy being in on the four check, five guys being in on the four check. All of a sudden, only two are in on the four check and the puck gets down the ice. Somebody scores. All kinds of things start setting in and you, you start losing that, uh, you know, that uh, feeling of invincibility. Yep. It happens. That yep. sets in. So, uh, yeah, so but now, Boston. yeah. So, so yeah, Boston actually, I just looked at the standings. They're five points behind Tampa Bay with the game in hand. Yep. And behind Boston in third spot is Toronto, and they are actually five points behind Boston. But Boston has three games in hand on Toronto. Yeah. Plus the five point lead. So in that sense, you know, they're essentially closer to Tampa Bay than they are to falling out of that spot, that number two. They're in a real strong hold of that number two spot in the uh, Atlantic right now. Right. Which is which is very good. And actually, if you look at the overall standings, officially Boston is third in the NHL in number of points. We're tied for third anyway. Tampa is still on top in the league with 65 Vegas is at 63, and then Boston, Nashville, and Washington are all tied at 60. That's right. And everybody else is in the 50s. Everybody else with a realistic shot of making the playoffs anyway. Right, right. They're, they're, uh, they're playing – I mean, you, you, we talked about Vegas to open the show, but Boston's, Boston's right there. The Colorado Avalanche. Yep. They're playing out of uh, – unbelievable right now, and that's who we have to play tomorrow. But uh, So there's some teams that are really, really, uh, you know – putting the pedal to the floor right now and uh you know makes for makes for watching some good hockey and they and they and they talk about how january and february are the dog days of you know how baseball has a dog days of summer yeah uh, the, the january and february is the dog days of winter and usually these two months are when uh teams start to separate themselves the good teams right. start showing like they are and the bad teams start falling in the standings so um, and yeah, to everyone's surprise, of course, we all, t you know, we talked about Vegas to open the show, uh, but, uh, Colorado, they're nine and one in their last 10. They've won eight in a row Yep. and they're now, um, 25, 16 and three who would have thought they'd be doing as well as they were, yep. uh, so far this season. LA is actually on the other side of things right now. They've lost five in a yep. row. They're three, six and one, although they still have, uh, a 24, 16 and five record. Thanks to the hot start that they got, um, they're they're falling fast. Yeah, I mean they basically passing Colorado in the night as far as the standings. Colorado's on their way up the standings, and L.A. is on their way down. And right now, uh, both teams are in a virtual tie with each other, uh, right. but they're headed in opposite directions. Uh, another team that's playing uh, extremely well, Nashville. Of course, they've been yep. playing well all season. But they've won four in a row. Yep, Nashville is playing very, very well. Yep, Calgary's won seven in a row. They're seven, two, Cal and one. And yep, the Calgary Flames playing exceptionally well. Yep, and we expected uh, them to be a good team this year, and they hadn't really shown it up until recently. But they they appear to be putting putting things together. So right. so yeah, I mean, there's there's <laughs> it's just a lot going on around the league that that just any, any, surprises. Any teams, any teams that you could say, hey, Steve, put a fork in. They're really, uh, they're really not gonna. They're they're toast. What was it last week? I said that about Edmonton. We did, uh, but here they are. They've won two straight, but you know they'll probably turn around and lose three more. So, um, yeah, you know, other than the teams that we've been talking about, of course, Arizona, Buffalo, Ottawa, uh, Montreal, Vancouver, Florida, Edmonton, uh, Detroit. I think we can put a fork in them. Yep. I just don't I, I, see. I just don't see any of those teams coming back. And Carolina, yeah. if they don't get things turned around, those two losses right there, I know it's only two in a row, but if it goes beyond that, they're they're heading in that direction too. Yeah, Carolina has to has to turn it around right now. Yep. And, you know, it, 
stranger things have happened. You you, you could see them in, in two weeks from now, and we're saying, oh, they're back in the playoff position. So because we've and we've talked about in the past that what ninety five points is is probably what it's going to take to get in the, the playoffs. Yeah, m- most most years. So if you look right. at that, they need um forty seven more points. They're halfway there. Yeah, they need forty seven more points and um, 36 37 games to do it 37 games to do it so Whew. that's a very good way to, to look at it Wayne yeah that's a very good uh measuring stick it's to it's use. doable it's doable we, but it is doable but if you if we not gonna say be that about every team uh, looking at the Pittsburgh Penguins okay they've got 34 games and they got to get 42 points yep hey you're gonna have to play some good hockey yep you know and, and that's a team that's definitely capable of doing it with all the talent they've got yep so uh, that's a very good measuring stick I like that one yep uh, um because and 95 points might not do it it might not do it it, it, it it'll at not. least it'll at least put them close to the line anyway oh yeah going into the last week of the season yeah yeah so yeah that's that's yeah because there was one season there recently Bruins got 96 points and they ended up on ninth place so <laughs> so yeah but nine, that been last year but most years 95 points is good enough for eighth place yeah but yeah, yeah there was a recent year there where the Bruins got 96 points and were um were in ninth place we're on the outside looking in which is mind-boggling to me knowing that yes, 90 96 points back years ago back Back before we had these three point games, anyway, uh, ninety six points was uh, was would get you third, third or fourth at worst <laughs> yeah. in the conference. No, no problem. That, that's <laughs> and, right. And, and home ice. Yeah. Now it doesn't even get you in the playoffs, guaranteed. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I don't believe there's a team out there though that has gotten ninety seven points and missed the playoffs. I don't think. Um, I think the the, the highest was the Bruins getting 96 that one year and missing the playoff. I think that's the most points right. any team has gotten and missed the playoffs. I could be wrong about that, and I'm sure some people will correct us if we are. But, yeah, so. All right, well, I don't have any other general discussion to go about, so let's talk about uh, some of the stories that we've got going on around the league. And, of course, we're going to start with injuries. I uh, know. I'm sorry, transactions. We had a couple of those. I actually I only have one. Uh, it's a signing. Defenseman Derek Englund signed a one-year, $1.5 million contract with the Vegas Golden Knights back on Monday. Englund could have become an unrestricted free agent on July 1st. He was selected from the Calgary Flames at the 2017 NHL expansion draft on June 21st and has 13 points in 41 games. Anglin, who's 35, has 99 points in 510 NHL games with the Penguins, Flames, and Ducks. I mean, and Knights. He is the third Golden Knights player who could have become an unrestricted free agent on July 1 to sign a contract with Vegas. Defenseman Braden McNabb signed a four-year $10 million contract back on November 30th, and forward Jonathan Marcheseau signed a six-year $30 million contract on January 3rd. Forwards David Perron and James Neal each can become unrestricted free agent on July 1. Uh, So those are two guys that we should look to see get signed here pretty quick. Uh, The Golden Knights lead the Western Conference with 61 points, or that was as of the writing of that article. I think they've got a couple more points since then. And are four behind the Tampa Bay Lightning, and they're actually two behind Tampa Bay for the best record in the league. Uh, So here's another signing here for Vegas. Uh, Basically looks like what uh, uh, they're doing is just going one by one down the whole roster and yeah. getting a sense for what the player you know wants, and they're at probably just point blank asking him, "Do you want to stay here? Yes or no? Yes, okay. Let's let's work on sign them. They just they're just picking off the the, <laughs> the list one by one. Because remember, if we go back to the uh, expansion draft, basically he drafted all guys that only have because he had to draft at least a certain amount that have a full year left on their contract. He couldn't just draft a bunch of players that were going into free agency. And then he could just wipe them clean and start with whatever he wants. Right. He had to draft guys at least, a, uh, it was I think it was 30 out of the 50 or something to, to that effect. I don't remember the exact rules off the top of my head. But there was a certain percentage, and it was more than half, that had to have at least a year left in their contract. And basically, that's what he did. He signed a, or he drafted a whole bunch of players that had a year left in their contract. He only had uh, a very few players that had more than a year on their contract. So that gives them the freedom to be able to sh- make this roster, you know, shape it, um, gives it, keeps the roster pretty fluid anyway in the first few years. So they're not locking themselves into any one player 
long term. Uh, yeah. But now that they've established uh, themselves as a, a pretty good team, these players are deciding now they want to stay. Right? <laughs> they think Vegas is fun. They're winning. So, <laughs> yeah. and of course, Derek Englund, he lives there. He's been right. living there in the off season for years. Yeah. So he was one of the one of the few players that came out and was very excited when Vegas got awarded a team, and he pretty much all but said he wanted to play there. So even when before that expansion draft, so obviously he's not going to want to go anywhere, and probably you're going to see, you know, given his age. And his, you know, with all due respect, his limited ability, um, they're just going to keep signing him to one-year contracts until he decides he's done. So you're going to see this signing every single year, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Probably <laughs> so. I wouldn't be surprised. But I, I'm I'm kind of surprised they haven't targeted James Neal yet because he's been a, a major cog in their, in their offensive machine. So um, I think you're going to look, you're going to see them. And, of course, you know, the article mentioned Perron as well. Uh, you're going to see those two players. If those players want to stay in Vegas, you're going to see them get signed here within the next, probably within the next month. Right. I'm sure they're going to stop all this stuff going into the playoffs. Uh, they may not even be allowed to sign players during the playoffs. I'm not sure how the collective bargaining rules are set up, but uh, uh, there may be a freeze on that stuff during the playoffs. Mm. But looks like we're going to be seeing the Vegas Golden Knights in the playoffs. Oh, I don't think there's any doubt. No doubt whatsoever be, in my mind. It'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see, A, who they get matched up with, and B, can Vegas Golden Knights beat a team when they have to play them seven games in a row? <laughs> uh, you know. It'll, uh, I see them as a team that's going to wear out a more talented. Say they end up against the Blackhawks in the first round. Right. You know, that, that's going to be a team that the longer the series goes, uh, the better chances that Vegas has to win the series. I think if it if it is if it's a short series, it's going to go against them. Right. Whereas, uh, you know, the longer they drag it out, the better. You know, they, they, you know, it's just the style that they play. They wear teams out. Right. With sixty minutes of of intensity, and they just um, I and I just see them just scaling that to a full series instead of just one game. Right. So it'll be fun to watch for sure. It'll give us a reason to watch. Because you know how the uh, the playoffs, the schedule usually goes is Eastern Conference one night, Western Conference yep. the next. Eastern Conference. Yep. It'll give us a reason to sit down and watch some Western Conference. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Stay up and watch them. P- put that same thing, though, against the Nashville Predators. Yeah. Oh, God. Hey, that would that, be a that's, fun series. That's a different story entirely now. Yeah. You see, and uh, the longer the series goes, I think the more it favors Nashville. Uh, so... You know, I don't know. We'll see. That there, that's there's that's going to be a, there's going to be some tests there. The first round, hey, they may they may skate through it, but you yep. get into the second round, they're going to be playing somebody. What and, if what if Vegas goes all the way to the Stanley Cup final? Yeah, I and even I, and even worse, what if they win? Yeah, it would shock the. I mean, the whole sports world. If I mean, if, it would just. Shock! I don't care if you're a football fan. Here's an expansion team winning the championship of with, the league they with play throwaway in. players. Yep, with that's what they are. They're throwaway players. They're the players yep. that the team that they came from didn't want. Yep. They, I mean, obviously you, you you can't say they didn't want them, but I guess that's kind of strong because obviously the teams wanted those players. They just couldn't keep them. They decided that they weren't one of their best eight players. Right. So. Vegas essentially, you know, I guess it's proven that you can win with just about anybody. It's just all about, you know, chemistry and every everything else. Right. There's a lot of intangibles that makes this incredibly difficult to pr- predict. So it'll right. be fun. It'll be fun to watch. It'll be a fun playoff year. All right. That's the only transaction I had unless you saw any that came across. No, that's the only one I saw as well. All right. As a matter of fact, I, I don't know any other. Okay. Let's head on to injuries then, and let's talk about Pittsburgh's uh, situation. I guess it's not really an injury, but we talked about it last week, Matt Murray just disappearing from the team and going to tend to a personal issue. Well, this week it came out what what uh, went on. Uh, goaltender Matt Murray will be away from the Pittsburgh Penguins indefinitely following the death of his father, James Murray, on Tuesday. Murray returned home to Ontario. He missed the Penguins' past two games, but was at practice on Tuesday. He's 15-12-1 with a 2.93 goals against average and 903 save percentage in 31 games this season. Um, I did not see exactly uh, what happened to his father, but um, it sounds like it was definitely unexpected. Right. So uh, our thoughts go out to, uh, of course, the Murray family as well. 
on uh, on that. Let's hope that uh, Matt can get um, get things in order and get back to uh, get back to Pittsburgh. Of course, when he's ready to come. But right. um, but yeah, I, I I just hadn't heard. I don't know if you saw anything about it. Well, what what mystifies me is he was at pra- practice on Tuesday. This was after I'm assuming his father passed away. And uh, why are they saying he's out indefinitely? He's gone home to be with the family. Okay. Um, but yeah, it looks like he was at practice on Tuesday, but then his father passed on Tuesday. So I don't oh, know. If that was... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's not a lot of details coming out about this whole uh, situation. So uh, maybe in time we'll find out for sure. If, if of course the family wants to uh, divulge that information, but, uh, um, but yeah, it sounds like it, for sure it was unexpected because uh, I had seen other like people tweeted that, that, you know, as, as recently as a few months ago, uh, his father w- was on a, um, you know how the, t- a lot of the teams do the father, son where the right. fathers, all the fathers come and, you right. know, go with the team on a road trip and basically be with the the sons that well he was part of that so yeah. um so yeah uh, it's just a tough situation for them and uh uh hopefully uh hopefully Matt will be okay on that whole on the high side of things and yeah. and he'll get back to playing hockey uh pretty soon cuz I'm sure that just playing hockey it's alone would be a, a bit of a release for him in that in that sense right so all right Next one we have uh, the Columbus Blue Jackets claim forward UC Jokinen off wa- waivers on Wednesday after putting forward Sonny Milano on injury reserve with a torn oblique muscle sustained in, against the Toronto Maple Leafs on January 8th. Milano, the number 16 pick in the 2014 NHL draft, will be out four to six weeks. He has 13 points in 35 games so far this season. Jokinen was waived by the Kings. He has six points in 32 games with the Kings and Edmonton Oilers. And, of course, UC Jokinen is known, and I don't know if he still is. I haven't seen him recently, but Jokinen is known around the league as being a bit of a shootout specialist. Yeah. A guy who who scores more than his share of shootout goals, we'll put it that way. So starting with the Carolina Hurricanes, I think, um, or maybe even with the Edmonton Oilers. I'm not sure at what point he began, began to get that role, but a lot of teams would sign Jokinen just simply to have him on the roster for shootouts. <laughs> right. Because he was so good at it. <laughs> right. Because at one point there, he was he was scoring shootout goals at, at better than a 50% clip. I don't know if he's still doing putting up numbers like that or not anymore. But, um, but it, yeah, either way, the, the injury to Milano, though, is um, is one that the Columbus Jackets didn't need, given the fact that how they are um, kind of been struggling as of late. You know, they haven't gone completely right. in the tank, but no. they're certainly not playing the way they were at the beginning of the season. They're they're one of those teams. Uh, uh, well, I need to step back. Uh, tie a game or get a point out of a game uh, and then lose a game and then win and then lose two and then win two and then lose, you know, they're, that's how they're playing. Yeah. Looking at the standings, they're four, five and one in their last 10. So yep. that, that is not something that they can afford to continue for too much longer. Right now they're still sitting. Uh, I believe they're still sitting in a playoff spot. Uh, yes, they are. They are a third, third in the East. Yes. In the th- the third, the the third in the Metro. Oh, they're right in the Metropolitan. But they are in danger of falling out. Um, they are only uh, two points ahead of Pittsburgh, which is sitting eighth in the conference. That's right. And uh, five points ahead of Philadelphia, which is sitting in ninth in the conference on the outside looking in. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, Columbus has got to get uh, get their situation resolved here fairly quickly. Otherwise, we're looking at uh, Columbus not making the playoffs, and that could entirely and, and happen. Both, both, yeah. <laughs> Both of us picked them to make the playoffs. Yep. So, uh, but I think I I think with the uh, with the Metro Division, there are going to be some good teams that are going to miss the playoffs there, just like there is in the Central. Right. There's going to be some good teams that miss the playoffs. Right. Because I they agree. just got they they were on the losing end of a dogfight in their own division. Right. I with you know with Colorado coming on right now, uh, and looks like they're making a push. But look at the Dallas Stars. I, I can see one of those teams falling out. Yep. Dallas is a good team. Well, there, on the outs- there's outs- one, there's one, there's two teams in Chicago and Minnesota that are good teams that yep. are on the outside right now. Right, yeah. looking good in. Point. 
So if everyone agrees that Minnesota and Chicago are going to make the playoffs, then who do you take out? You've got to take two out. Yeah. Colorado, Dallas, St. Louis, Winnipeg, and Nashville. Two of those are going to miss the playoffs if if Chicago and Minnesota are going to make it. It's just it's just crazy this this I could, this, this yeah, year. Yeah, it is. Yep. It's just crazy. The NHL has always wanted to have the regular season games obviously you're never going to have a mean as much as a playoff game, but you certainly don't want any throwaway games in the regular season. Well, I think they have definitely accomplished that goal. <laughs> you know, without a doubt, without a doubt. So yeah. Anyway, so Columbus has got some more injury issues. All right, let's talk about Sebastian Ajo. He's out indefinitely for the Carolina hurricanes with a concussion and a lower body injury. The forward was assessed I mean, was injured in a 4-1 to loss against the Calgary Flames at PNC Arena on Sunday when he was hit by Mark Giordano, defenseman, who was assessed a match penalty for an illegal check to the head. Selected by the Hurricanes in the second round of the NHL draft in 2015, Ajo is the leader uh, for Carolina in goals and points. Uh, the Hurricanes are on a six-day break and play the Detroit Red Wings at Little Caesars Arena on Saturday. Uh, this loss or losing Ajo is is extremely huge for the Carolina Hurricanes because he he was he's been the catalyst for their offense for the whole season really. Yep. I mean, even on nights that he doesn't score, you you know he's on the ice every to every shift. You, he's just so much better than everybody else on the on the Hurricanes team, right? Uh, or at least he's playing better than everybody else. He's. He's he's always in the middle of middle of the play. He definitely always... is electric. He's electric. Yeah. He he has he has the the uh when he shoots the puck it's it's um uh it just it's it's a beautiful thing to watch. He knows how to uh use the velocity of his of his uh, stick. He, he's he's good at he's it's a smooth rhythm when he shoots it. Um, he's just, he's just a phenomenal, I think he's a phenomenal player. And I agree with you when he's on the ice, you, you know, the hurricanes are looking to get the puck to him. Uh, uh, and that's a big injury. That's a big injury for him. So, um, they need him back and they need people stepping up. Yep. Yeah. They definitely need him back. Uh, and because of the hurricanes are on break, we haven't had any news concerning this injury come from them. But when they last put anything about it, you know, talking about ha- him being out indefinitely, uh, the scary part is it says that he's probably not coming back anytime soon, right? Which is is something that they don't need, right? As as we mentioned a million times, I mean, they're in a dogfight for playoff spot. Um, so uh, yeah, it's just it's a tough thing for the Hurricanes, and they've been relatively healthy this year. The Hurricanes have. This is really the first major injury that they've had. If you want to count the Lee Stempniak not playing until about a week ago all season as a right. major as a major injury for them. In terms of offensive firepower anyway, this is the first uh major injury that Carolina has suffered this year that I can think of. Right. So we'll I see agree. we'll see how they respond to it for sure. All right, Edmonton Oilers. This one came down today. Uh Edmonton Oilers center Ryan Nugent Hopkins will miss five to six weeks with cracked ribs. Nugent Hopkins, who was placed on injury reserve on Thursday, leads the Oilers with 16 goals and is third with 31 points in 46 games. He was injured late in the second period of Edmonton's most recent game, a 3-2 overtime win at Vegas on January 13th. That preceded a six-day break. Um, yeah, he's not Connor McDavid, but Nugent Hopkins is still one of the top handful of players that Edmonton has on their roster. So, um, yeah, we were talking about the Oilers. We've basically stuck a fork in them already this year. Yep. So him being hurt obviously is not going to help them if right. they if they want to make some sort of a comeback. But, uh, uh, you know, obviously it's a big injury for uh, the Oilers to deal with. Um, and it looks like the talk out of Edmonton that I saw – is um, with Nugent Hopkins being in the lineup, that has given Edmonton the ability to put Dreisaitl and McDavid on the same line. And right. now it looks like they're probably going to have to take those two and put them on separate lines yep. because yep. Edmonton just simply doesn't have the depth at forward to have four good, strong lines. Right. I see it as, uh, uh, well, it's a big loss, of course, for the Edmonton Oilers, but I, as I, you know, I, I liken it back to, to and now Buffalo's in a totally different situation. They're not going to make the playoffs. And last night when the game opened up, they were talking to uh, to uh, Jack uh, 
uh, uh, I'm forgetting his name right now, but you know who I'm talking about. Uh, Jack Eichel of uh, the Buffalo Sabres and said, you know, chances are you're probably not going to make the playoffs. And he was res- resolved to, yeah, we're probably not going to make the playoffs. You know, oh, uh, shit. But we've yeah. got to try to play consistently each game. Well, yeah. I, I don't know that I would – you, you'd see any announcers coming out at this moment in time and saying, Edmund, well, you're probably not going to make the playoffs and talking to a player of Edmonton that way. But you really could say the chances of them making the playoffs are becoming remote. Uh, they're not – they're probably not going to make the playoffs. So, yeah, it's a, lo- it's, a, it's a big loss to them, but it's a team that's not going to make the playoffs. So um, – God, I don't know how to say it. Uh, I hope Brian Nugent Hopkins comes back this year and plays exceptionally well for the time remaining in the season. And, you know, Edmonton should start trying to win each game that they're playing and just look yep. at it as, hey, we'll do our best, you know, because yep. um, that's how Buffalo's looking at it. Well, if we use our 95-point example that we talked about, Edmonton is currently sitting at 43 points. So they are uh, tw- uh, 52 points away from that 95-point yeah. mark. They've played yeah. 45 games, so that means they only have, what, 37 left? 30, 37 left, yep. 37 left to, to, to get 52 points. To get 52 points. And that might get them the, uh, the wild card, the eighth-place spot. Yep. Can they get 52 points in 37 games? If it was last year's team, I'd say yes. Sure. <laughs> but this year's team hasn't shown any sign of, sure. being, able, of well, being able to. If they don't have any regulation, if they win every game in, in regulation, uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If they Let's put it this way. If, if the 52 points are made up from them all wins, they got to win 26 games. Out of 37. 26 games out of 37. You've yep. got to be playing good hockey to do that. Exceptionally yep. good hockey to do that. Yep. You know, okay, so they, they let's let's t- take it back and say they get uh, – they have to have uh, 20, 24 wins or 22 wins and four uh, overtime. You know what I'm saying? I yeah. mean, you could, you, you could start to look at it that way. Well, they still got to be, you know, 22 and 11. Right. So, you know, and, and four, four ties. So they, they're going to have to play very, very well to, to get there. And yep. I, I just, I, you know, I, I don't know that that that's going to happen. I, I that's really, a lot of, that's a lot of seven and three and eight and two ten game. Yeah, yeah that's <laughs> 10 right. Game, ten game uh, swings. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. That's tough. Yeah. All right. Well, equally tough in terms of tough losses is uh, the last injury I have is Kevin Shattenkirk. That one came down today. That the New York Rangers have lost Kevin Th- yep. Th- Th- Shattenkirk indefinitely because of a meniscus tear in his left knee and will have surgery on Monday. Shattenkirk, who has played in all of uh, 46 of the Rangers games, said at practice at Friday that he's been playing with knee pain since training camp and didn't make sense to continue without having the surgery. He said he's planning to rehab in time for the in time to be back with the Rangers before the end of the season, their final regular season game is against the Flyers on April 7th. Shattenkirk, who signed a four-year contract with the Rangers in July 1, has 23 points, uh, five goals, and 18 assists. He has no goals and eight assists in 30 games since November 6th, and has one point in 13 games December 19th. He played 17-17, did not have a point in New York's 4-3 win against the Sabres, Madison Square Garden on Thursday. All right. So it looks like Shattenkirk's been hurt all along. He's just been trying to play through the pain, and obviously his recent numbers have shown that uh, it's become more and more difficult because he really hasn't done a whole lot in terms of putting points on the board anyway uh, in, no, recent, in recent couple weeks. Uh, yeah, he he has he has he has not. Uh, it it has been noticeable um, in, it, as of late with his play. Uh, I think his time on ice has actually dropped too. Because he was kind of on fire at the beginning of the season. Absolutely, and then he kind of cooled off. Well. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it, it it's noticeable. Uh, the fact that he is coming out now and saying he has an injury, uh, as you and I talk a lot on this show, these guys play hurt. Uh, they really don't want the team personnel to know maybe sometimes so that they are not, uh, the, uh, the, the guy who gets, uh, put down and, and, and goes through, uh, whatever surgery or rehab in the AHL or whatever. And somebody else gets pulled up and, and put on the team and takes, takes their job. Yep. 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 So, uh, but in the case of Kevin Shattenkirk, I don't think that would happen, but, uh, it's a, it, nonetheless, it's a tough loss. It's New York's top scorer on the blue line. 
what do they do? Well, they're going to put Brady Shea in his place for the most part, uh, whether he captains the, the power play or not to the extent that Kevin Shadkirk did. That might be exactly what they do, but it remains to be seen. Uh, and I think Brady Shea can step in there pretty well. Uh, I, I think he can fill that role. They're also calling up uh, D'Angelo from the Wolfpack, okay. uh, who they got from Arizona earlier in the year. So uh, they have some guys, and when D'Angelo has an NHL appearance, uh, they can call up and put in his place to uh, stop the lead. Uh, but in the case of Brady Shea, uh, he's got a lot of experience in these last couple of years. His rookie year last year, he played very well. Um, and he, I, I just, I, I think it's a tough loss, uh, but I think we can do well if Brady Shea plays well. If he plays well, steps into this role, sees it as an opportunity for him to step up and become a permanent fixture, uh, a Rangers top four defenseman, um, which he might be right now, um, but can cement his future. Uh, I think we're in good shape. And I'm, I'm looking at this from a positive viewpoint. We're going to miss Kevin Shattenkirk. Yep. <laughs> but uh, we have we have pieces there. Uh, you know, we're not we're not. It's not like woe is me. Oh my God, what what are we going to do? Well, Ryan Nugent Hopkins is a big loss for Edmonton. I, no way you can sit here and say they have guys who are going to step up and 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 uh, step into his shoes right away. Um, but we have a guy I just met. You know, in Brady Shea, that can step up and and come close. So, uh, well, and that's the, that's the thing I want to ask is, you know, Brady Shea, obviously he's young. He's only 23. Um, has he been able to, has he, be, because of the fact that you've got, uh, uh, Shattenkirk there, you've got, um, McDonough there and you've got Stahl there, you know, you've got some big names back on the blue line, which has been able to give the Rangers uh, a way to not have to play Shea as much being as young as he is. Uh, the guy's a first round draft pick. Yeah. Yeah. Like five, what, five years ago or so it's Brady Shea was a f- five year draft pick. Has yep. he has he been given a legitimate shot to be a top pairing D yet for the Rangers? I don't think he has. No, and I think this might be his shot. Yep. to show what he can do. Absolutely. I mean, and, this, and is his, he, this is what his second you know, full year. Take it a step. Is is that a shaky thing to do? No, that, that's what I'm, I'm saying. He's played well enough. For, yeah, I I got confidence in the guy. He can yeah. really really turn this into something where hey, this is my chance. And when, Shatt- when when Kevin Shattenkirk comes back to play, uh, boy, we're going to even be better than we are right now. But I'm going to step in there. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, if Shea plays well. I mean, see, on, if, you t- if you take the Bruins' perspective, you know, last season they had Brandon Carlo who played a lot of minutes. But that was out of necessity. Bruins didn't have a lot of depth on D. Not Certainly right. not like the Rangers. Uh, this year, it's been Charlie McAvoy. He's been getting the bulk of it. Before that, it was uh, Tory Krug, who was right. playing a lot as a as a young player, out of necessity because right. the Bruins, the Bruins in recent years just haven't had the depth at defense, which has forced them to advance these young players. And now it's it's paying off because now all these guys have a lot of ex- extra experience that they probably wouldn't have had on another another team. Um, where the Rangers have had so much depth on D, it's kind of kept players like Shea down. Um, right. And, uh, you know, with this Shattenkirk injury, yeah, they still got Stahl. They still got McDonough. Uh, obviously, Stahl's not going to be your power play guy. He's more of a shutdown D now, but um, but he still takes a bulk of, you know, a huge bulk of the minutes away right. from some of the other players. And I think this will be Shea's chance to shine I agree. And, and really show what he can do. So. Right. And I think his success or failure will be a huge factor in how uh, how well the Rangers play overall as a team in the next uh, couple of months but until uh, until Shattenkirk's ready to come back. I agree. And if he plays, agree, yeah. like you said, if he plays well and then yeah. Shattenkirk comes back, oh, God, wow. <laughs> Here come the playoffs. Yeah. You know? <laughs> right. Awesome. You know, so you never know. An opportunity like that now, uh, you know, we're not talking about Chris Kreider right now. It's that's a different story. But uh, th- there's a couple injuries, and, and again, I've I've thrown out there on on that injury. It, I see Rick Nash coming on. He's two, four goals in two games, uh, points, and in, in, in uh, you know he's playing well. So if I'm a Rangers fan right now, I'm looking at the positive side of it, not the negative side of it. They need to play consistently, and I, and I think they will. So uh, hang in there.
Yep. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's talk about some suspensions and fines. First and foremost, Anaheim Ducks forward Andrew Cogliano was suspended on Sunday for two games, which will end his consecutive games played streak at 830. Cogliano was disciplined for interference against the Kings forward Adrian Kempe. Uh, the incident occurred at 341 of the first period at Staples Center on Saturday. Cogliano received a two-minute penalty for interference. Uh, Cogliano will not play against the Colorado Avalanche at Pepsi Center on Monday, uh, ending the fourth longest consecutive play games play streak in NHL history after Doug Jarvis, who has 964 games, Gary Unger, who had 914, and Steve Larmer with 884. He had not missed a game in 11 NHL seasons since his debut with the Edmonton Oilers against the San Jose Sharks on October 4th, 2007. The 30-year-old who signed a three-year contract with the Ducks on Friday has 18 points in 44 games this season. So, um, with suspension aside, I took a look to see who our new Ironman leader is currently, and that is Keith Yandel, who's at 675, followed by Patrick Marlowe, who's at 669, Phil Kessel at 654, and Carl Alsner at 582. Yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. Um, because the NHL, and I know you wanted to, and we may want to choose to do this right now. I know you wanted to talk about Andrew Cogliano as part of your pick of the week. Yep. Um, and we may as well just go ahead and do it right now. But I'll, I'll throw my two cents in, and then you can say what you wanted to say about it. Um, okay. These Ironman streaks, with the modern-day NHL, with them suspending players game here, two games there, for every little thing that happens on the ice, yeah. Um, these Iron Man streaks, I think it just more solidifies Doug Jarvis's record nine sixty four. I don't yeah. think we're ever going to see anyone approach that again because it, it, nowadays it doesn't take much to get a one game suspension. It really doesn't. Um, my my that was my point entirely is is that and, and I watched this tape quite a bit actually. Um, I, I watched the replay of it. Um, it was definitely interference. There's no question. Oh, yeah. It. The it was puck definitely was... interference. And I could see them throwing a fine at him. I could say, yeah, you know. The puck uh, was, was long gone. Well, after. And in fact, the other player had received the puck and was, uh, you know, there's no question about it. It was penalty. I don't know uh, what the guy was penalty. thinking when he hit him. He, yeah. I don't he, know why he did it. He took like three or four strides after yeah. the puck was gone. Right. But that being said, I don't think he should have been suspended for even one game. Now I don't know whether that whether, whether I don't know the the injury status of Adrian Kempe. Um, his first name Adrian, I think yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, I don't know the injury status of him, but and I don't know if he played the next game or didn't play for the rest of that game because I didn't watch it. But um, I don't think that that I do not I do not think that uh, Andrew Cogliano deserved to be suspended for even one game. I can see giving him a fine. He had no history, no prior history of any kind of uh, problem on the ice in regards to that. Um, and, and I'm not sure why that happened. I don't know why the NHL Player Safety Board picked him out and said, you know what, it's his time. Because you have fans who are following, like myself, who are following this Iron Man streak. And we're not talking about, uh, you know, um, Lou Gehrig or, or, or anybody like that in baseball. This is totally different. This is nowhere near the same as baseball. Um, not nearly as rough a sport on your body. Um, these hockey players that, that get up to eight, seven, eight hundred games played without missing one, that is an incredible feat. Yep. And um, you, you, you're not going to see, you're not going to, 11 seasons without missing a game, if you'll think about that. We're all hockey fans. That is unbelievable. Yep. That is a truly incredible feat. And he's playing now where the game is so fast. It's just you're not going to see somebody catch uh, catch these guys up at the top if the player safety board is going to make decisions like that. Um, I think that was a, the wrong thing to do. I, I, as a fan, really wanted to see Andrew Cogliano t- have, have his shot at getting up into 900 games and then see what happens, you know. Um, and that's not going to happen. I thought it was a... I just thought it was a poor, poor decision. Um, and, you know, it had it had it been something where uh, Kempe was taken out of the game on a straight or even, you know, and I hate to say things like this, but had he been hurt, you know, to the extent where he missed a game, 
uh, I don't know. I don't know how to, to word this properly. Um, I don't know his playing status right at this very second. I really don't. Well, I don't think he, he I don't think he got hurt initially on the play because he only got a minor penalty. If 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 Kempe would have gotten hurt on the play, uh, that would have elevated it to a major or right. a ma- or a match. And, and Cogliano right. would have been thrown out of the game. Uh, he got a two minute minor. So now right. you're going to get suspended where on the ice, it's a two minute penalty. Like I, I'm, I'm with you. I, I don't see where the consistency is here. Yep. Um, okay. You're going to suspend Cogliano, but the next uh, player on, on our, in this particular part of the podcast, we're going to talk about is Dustin Brown who got a fine for what he right. did. And, and I saw both plays and I think what Brown and Cogliano both did, uh, to me, was you know both required some sort of action by the NHL. I bo- I agree that. Right. But why a Brown gets a, a fine where Cogliano gets a suspension? I don't understand. I don't get why one is is that much more severe than the other. To me, they look both equally dangerous. Both right. plays should have either been both suspended or either been both fine. But why one get a fine and one get a suspension? I I I don't I don't get it. I don't. That's an excellent excellent point, Wayne. I just don't see the consistency. So I agree. And, and I'm not saying that the league is biased in any way towards one team or another. I'm, it, that's not what I'm getting at. I just don't. I, I I'd like it to be okay. You see the play, okay, you know that's going to be a two-gamer or that's going to be a one-gamer or you know that's yep. going to be a fine when you see certain plays. And and I'm sure it has something to do with headshots. They're, they're penalizing those more severe to right. try to get that out of the game. And I think where Cogliano, and probably the difference is, and I could be wrong about it, but Cogliano was a shot to the head where Dustin Brown was just a, a checking from behind where he, you know, face planted him into the boards um that's probably why coglianos gets suspended and browns doesn't but um you know i don't know for sure that that's the case all right so you know i i'm looking for you know the consistency i'm looking for the correlation between you know yeah. what goes on and, and what happens after the fact and um, i agree and and don't forget no prior history in 11 seasons no prior history of any violence uh, any reason to pull the guy Yep. And su- you suspend him previously. So maybe uh, in the f- yeah. So maybe in the future, what they do in a case like this to protect these Iron Man streaks is they they adjust the system, whereas they start with a fine and make it a hefty one, right? For shots to the head. Okay, now you're losing, uh, you know, five percent of your salary or two percent, whatever they decide, right? And you know, make it a percentage so that it. So that because if you if you were to make it a flat rate, well, if you were to find Andrew Cogliano, fifty thousand dollars, you know, make it something that hurts. Right. Fifty thousand dollars for a first offense on, right. a, on a shot to the head. Well, fifty thousand dollars to Andrew Cogliano is different than fifty thousand dollars to Connor McDavid. Right. So you you really would need to make it a percentage of the salary. Right. That way it hits the players, uh, you know, about equal to what their their value is. Right. Um, and maybe if you hit them that way first and then start and then go on to the games then you know you if you have a player where they've got this long streak going that you're not you're not destroying a streak based on you know uh, a uh, a you know a, a, a bang bang to split you know decision kind of play that just happens in the heat of a moment right which ruins a 11 year streak <laughs> yeah and you know it, it listen it was a poor it was a poor it was poor judgment on cogliano's part it was stupid. He had time to avoid uh, I, it. Yep. I think in his mind, he knew that puck was. I don't think there's any doubt that that was. Yeah, there was some reckless disregard for things. Um, but I again, uh, I I don't think that that raised itself to the level um, to to suspend a guy for two games and and take him out of uh, any shot of him. He's not. You know, he'll never play another eleven seasons and get up to that point. So. The streak is over and uh, there's no chance of it. But, you know, I, I don't know. It, it's it's the league's decision uh, that I find perplexing. And I don't understand the consistency part of it, Wayne. I think that's what you're hitting on is, is really the, the crux of the matter. Yeah. Uh, so. All right. So we'll quickly just uh, give you the details of Dustin Brown's suspension since we did address that as well. Ellie Kings forward Dustin Brown got fined $10,000. The maximum allowable under the collective bargaining agreement um, via Section 18.7D for cross-checking Pittsburgh Penguins defenseman Justin Schultz 
during NHL game number 704 in L.A. on Thursday, January 18th. Uh, the incident occurred at 636 of the third period. Brown was assessed a major penalty in a game misconduct for boarding. So basically what happened there, I don't know if you saw the play, but Schultz was going in and kind of fell to his knees, and he's sliding across the ice on his knees up against the boards trying to play the puck um, when Dustin Brown comes up behind him and just cross-checks him in the back and sends him straight into the boards, you know, face first um, while he's on his knees. So that, that hit was obviously unnecessary, and, uh, and Schultz was down for a few minutes after that, but I don't think he will miss any time, though. Mm-hmm. as a result of it so excuse me so yeah that ultimately was the other suspension of the week all right and one other interesting story that i came across of course we talked about team canada last week and team usa the week before in terms of olympic rosters well sweden this past week released theirs and one player that i'm going to be watching that week is a kid by the name of rasmus Dahlin. yeah uh, he has not yet been drafted he'll be drafted this june and he's projected to go number one overall. Uh, he's a defenseman for Team Sweden, but he will be on the Olympic roster. So right. uh, for those of you who are going to watch some Olympic hockey, uh, that is a player that you're going to want to watch because somebody uh, or some team, I should say, who's going to miss the playoffs is going to end up with this kid. And they're saying that uh, he's going to be a good one. Right. So. And, you know, good defensemen are hard to come by, so this kid could be uh, a pretty good... Uh, he's projected to be a top-pairing D for sure. I agree. So, And I really didn't see um, much of the rest of the roster. It's safe to say that it's pretty much made of the same type of players that are playing for Canada and Team USA. Uh, although with Sweden, it's mostly players that are made up of uh, KHL, Swedish Elite League players. That's pretty much where all their players are coming from. Mm-hmm. So it'll be uh, another team to watch in February. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And and uh, I we they they actually t- went on about uh, Rasmus Dalin last night. Yep. Uh, so uh, I got to hear about him actually for the first time. So I did not watch him. Uh, the the uh, I I didn't pay any attention really to him during the World Juniors. So. And he was a big uh, part of their team, yep. and they ended up with the silver medals. So, so yep. So uh, it'll be interesting to watch. It it will be. And I don't know the way it's looking right now. Is Arizona get the first pick? You never know with the lottery. Yeah. Well, now with the lottery, the way it's set up, anybody can end up with the. Because it used to be when they first came up with the lottery system, if you were the lottery winner, you got to move up four spots. Right. So if you were in that bottom four, you could move up to the number one. But if you were outside that. If you were the fifth worst team in the NHL, actually, I should say the sixth worst team in the NHL, um, and you won the lottery, the best you could do is second. Well, now you can be, uh, what is it, 14 teams don't make the playoffs? No, 15 now. This year is 31 teams. So 15 teams are going to be outside the playoffs. Mm-hmm. You can be the 15th worst team or basically the, the best team outside the playoffs. If you win the lottery, you win the number one pick. Right. Now, now, the chances are better. The, the worse your team is, the more so, so-called ping pong balls go into the into the kettle for yep. the for the worst teams. But everybody has a chance of winning it, at least some sort of chance. And um, and now the lottery system is if you win it, and they pick three now. So if you win, if you're one of the three balls that they pick, that's that's picks one, two, and three. Right. So if you finish dead last in the NHL, which Buffalo or Arizona likely will, one of those two will. Uh, if they don't end up being one of the three ping pong balls, they're going to pick fourth. Right. So. <laughs> right. So yeah, it makes it it makes it that much more difficult to tank. You certainly wouldn't want to tank with with rules like that because usually if you're outside the top three in the draft, you're missing out on a pretty good player. It'll prevent teams like uh, Chicago and and Pittsburgh from tanking year after year after year to stock up on real good players. Right. And then and then put together a dynasty later down uh, later on. So hopefully that w- that kind of activity will end. Not that I'm saying that they were doing that, but or actually Edmonton was doing similar to that too how many years did they end up with the number one overall pick right under the old rules but it's much more difficult now okay let's move on uh to honors and milestones calgary flames left wing johnny goudreau uh calgary flames goaltender mike smith and pittsburgh penguins right wing phil kessel uh have been named the nhl's three stars for the week ending january 14th goudreau led the nhl with eight points in four games 
to propel the Flames to a perfect week, helping the team extend its overall winning streak to eight games. Smith stopped 104 out of 108 shots against, going 3-0 and with a 1.32 goals against average and 963, um, also uh, helping the Flames to their great week. And then Phil Kessel registered a five-point week in two games, scoring the winning goal in each contest to lift the Penguins to the first wild card spot in the Eastern Conference. So that's Phil Kessel, Mr. Uh, not an all-star Phil Kessel, right? That's right. I don't think he made the all-star team, but congrats to those guys. And, of course, having two flames in the top in the uh, the three stars of the week tells you how good of a week that team had. Yep, playing and, very well. Yep, and the other milestone or honor this week, Eric Lindros, I don't know if you saw this, who spent eight of his 14 seasons with the Flyers, became the sixth player to have his jersey number retired uh, by the Flyers on Thursday. Lindros, who was the 94-95 Hart Memorial Trophy winner, was inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame in 2016. Though he spent time with the Rangers, Maple Leafs and Islanders, uh, and Stars, I'm sorry. It was his 659 points in 486 games with the Flyers for which he'll be remembered. A banner with Lindros's name and number was raised to the rafters at Wells Fargo Center uh, last night. There it will join Bernie Perrant, Mark Howe, Barry Ashby, Bill Barber, and Bobby Clark. And his career numbers, 760 games played, 372 goals, 493 assists, 865 points to go along with 1,398 penalty minutes. And uh, he will be best remembered by me as the top player in my draft year. <laughs> oh. <laughs> if if I were an NHL quality player and I w- were to have been drafted, he would have been the, um, the, uh, the top. He was the first overall pick in the 1991 draft. And that was, that was the year that I was eligible to be drafted. You know, every kid remembers their own draft year, right? <laughs> right. That's right. Well, that's, you know, that's and, pretty good. And he was a scary good player coming out of that, too. I he remember the talk about him. He was an exceptional player. He was, you know, he he had that rare ability of having both size and skill that pretty much up to that point, only Mario Lemieux was known to have, and maybe Yager, if you consider him a big player. Mm-hmm. Yager was tall, but he wasn't necessarily uh, big and strong. Well, uh, Eric Lindros was not only you know tall but he was strong and uh, and and had in exceptional hands yep. total package player he was and uh to the point where you know he he had that big controversy i don't know if you remember that back at the beginning of his his uh his tenure you know he gets drafted he actually went first overall to Quebec to the Nordiques yeah but then refused to play to go there he didn't want to go there because up to that point Quebec was a very bad team oh yeah like they only had uh, I can't remember exactly what their record was but they were only you know 10 12 wins out of the whole season he didn't want to go there right he wanted to win so and he thought of Quebec as as being a um, um, you know a team that was never going to put it together so shortly after he gets drafted in Quebec the Nordiques end up putting a package together uh, to send him to the Flyers now there was also wasn't there a reported trade too that that apparently that the Quebec had traded him to two different teams at the same time oh God I, yeah, I, and I think I think the Rangers were were the other team that were that were supposed like they apparently the the story comes out that there was a trade and I'm trying to remember the details that there was a trade in place for Eric Lindros to go to the Rangers with a package of players going back to Quebec but then at the last second the Flyers came through with a better offer and before that that one was officially finalized at the league office with the Rangers they went ahead and and made the trade with the Flyers instead because the Flyers got in return uh, a young kid named Peter Forsberg yeah Starting which start which was a better player than than the Rangers would have been able to give him at the time. Mm-hmm. So Eric Lindros was this close to going to the Rangers, but <laughs> but but didn't. Ended up going to Philadelphia instead. Yep. And Good then, memory. Course, and then of course the uh, you know the Legion of Doom line happened with uh, Vermont boy uh, John Leclaire and uh, Michael Renberg. That yep. line, oh man, they, that was a that was a tough line to play against. Oh, Philadelphia man. had some good teams during those years. They did. They, they did. But they never really put it together to, to win a Stanley Cup. But yeah, great player, Eric Lindros. And he's just under a month older than I am. 
That was almost my pick of the week. Oh, <laughs> was it? <laughs> it was almost my pick of the week. But I, I wound up talking about Andrew Cogliano because I figured, well, we'll talk about this in the milestone segment. So, yep. Almost picked that. Yep. All right. Well, we're on to the power rankings. The power rankings. That's right. It's it's finally come around. It's my week again. Yep. And I don't know what you're going to think about these, Wayne. You, you might have... You might not have any any beef with it at all, but I I made some some serious moves in here. Yeah, you did. <laughs> comparatively speaking, to uh, to weeks the, the previously, uh, so I'm going to start out at number 17. Our honorable mention, and there's one right there. I moved the Los Angeles Kings all the way out to number 17. They were number eight last week, yep. but they lost five in a row. Yep. And technically right now they're on the outside looking in. Had they beat the Penguins last night, they'd still be in my top 16. But Pittsburgh handed it to them last night, so they are now number 17. And right above them, number 16, the Pittsburgh Penguins. I put Pittsburgh behind the Rangers. I put Ranger, the New York Rangers at 15, even though they beat us on Sunday. And the only reason for that is the fact that we are um, right now ahead of them. We have we have a game in hand, if not two games in hand. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sitting here looking at the numbers right now. But that's why we're ahead of Pittsburgh. So uh, number 14, the San Jose Sharks. Number 13, a team that is 7-2-1 and one in, their la- in their last 10, Calgary Flames. Yep. Number 12, the Colorado Avalanche, who are 9-1 and one in their last 10. Yep. Won eight in a row. Eight, and eight wins in a row. Hottest, hottest team, I would say, the hottest team in the NHL right now. Pretty close. Yep. Number 11, the Toronto Maple Leafs. Sputtering right now. Yeah, they're they're inconsistent at best. Yep. Number 10, another sputtering team, the Columbus Blue Jackets. We talked about them earlier. Number 9, the Dallas Stars. Number 8, the New Jersey Devils. They continue to stay in the top 10, although they're shaky. They're, they're not Columbus- shaky but you know that they're not again i i don't see the devils lasting maybe they will number seven the st louis blues number six the winnipeg jets number five the nashville predators number four the washington capitals and i moved your boston bruins all the way up to number three with their play and yeah points in the last 15 14 in the last 15 is that right 15 in a row 15 in a row now yep. incredible number two a team that defies logic, the Vegas Golden Knights. <laughs> and I put at number one, even though they lost, I put the Tampa Bay Lightning at number one, although that may change next week. I don't know whether Tampa Bay is going to stay there, but I kept them at a shaky number one right now in the NHL. And we'll see what happens this week. Yeah, and I probably would have put Vegas at number one just simply due to the result of last night's game. Vegas beating Tampa Bay in a head-to-head matchup. Um, and, and they would definitely, and that would be, it's kind of a 1-1-A right now, but if Vegas right. wins tonight and takes over that top spot uh, in the uh, point standings, I would definitely put Vegas as the clear number one if Vegas wins that game tonight. So should be fun. So Vegas is on that, uh, that, I don't know if the Western Conference teams talk about, you know how we talk about in the East, the, the Western, the California road trip or the Western Alberta road trip, you know, where they, where they play all the teams, you know, in a row, boom, boom, boom. It seems like all, every team has to go out west to do the California road trip. You know, L.A., Anaheim, San Jose. I wonder if they talk about the southeast road trip out west, where because that's what Vegas is on now. They did Nashville a couple nights ago, and then they're doing Florida tonight, and then uh, actually no, the Nashville game I think was last night, and then Florida tonight, and then Carolina. So do they talk about the Nashville, <laughs> Florida, the, Carolina southeast road trip? The southeast swing or the yeah Tampa, Tampa, Florida, Carolina, Nashville is the southeast swing. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, just to know. But and and just to lead to your uh, number three seeding of the Boston Bruins, if you look at the standings, the Bruins now have, and I know it's just one column, but they have fewer regulation losses than any other team in the league. They stand alone with ten losses. Everybody else has at least eleven. Very good, very good. You could make a case that Boston could be number two, but uh, I just, I just, the only reason I didn't put them there is because they're. they're the, of the of the number of no, points ahead, Tampa yeah, Bay. And, sorry. Yeah, there's still a gap between Boston and Tampa Bay and uh, and Vegas. So, so yeah. no, I I wouldn't put the Bruins any higher than third myself. Mm. At least not yet. <laughs> they, right. they keep winning, they're going to get there. Or they keep At getting, least. if they keep getting points in every game they play, they're going to get there for sure. 
All right. Yeah. I don't, uh, other than that, I don't disagree really with anything uh, uh, in that top power ranking. You, you made a pretty fair case on in every point. So, hey, we've been talking Calgary from the very first of the season. They're not letting us down. Nope. Johnny Gaudreau is playing out of his mind. He's having a great year. Yeah. And they have a nice defense core, too. Yeah. And Mike Smith is having a good year back in net. So, that's a that's a good team they put together there in Calgary. It's it's good to see that they're finally playing like it. All right, let's look ahead to the week upcoming uh, because we only have um, as of tonight only seven games left or seven nights left of hockey before uh, the All Star break. That's right. Uh, Thursday, the twenty fifth, upcoming. That says. Uh, well, essentially six nights from today is the last night before the All-Star break. Mm -hmm. So, And everybody's whining, speaking of the All-Star break, whining and complaining about why this player on their favorite team didn't make the All-Star game and why this player. Bruins fans are complaining why Tuca is not there and why Bergeron is not there. You know what I say? Good. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Give yeah. those guys a break. They're going to need the rest. They're going to need the rest to, uh, going into the playoffs. I would gladly sacrifice a Stanley Cup or sacrifice All Star appearances in order to get that much closer the to the Stanley Cup. Cup. Right. I agree with you. I would give that up in a heartbeat, and I know the players would too. So Bergeron's been there almost every year for the last who knows how many years. Let's give him a break this time. Send Marshan. Yep. Marshan can go. And quite right. honestly, nowadays with thirty-one teams. Going to the All Star game, or, or thirty one teams in the league, and only forty four players go to the All Star game. Not many teams are getting more than one these days, right? You know, when it was twenty one game, twenty one teams in the league, every team was sending two or three players. But now, thirty one teams in the league, and only forty four make it. Yeah, there's, there's, you know, there's a, only most teams are only sending one now, yep. which I, I'm fine with. Give these players a break. They play a lot of hockey, so all right. With that. Let's look ahead. The Bruins have a relatively light schedule. Um, again, mm -hmm. it seems like Boston's always got a light schedule every week, yeah. <laughs> which is going to come back to bite them because the month of March and April is is crazy busy. They have uh, lots of back to back games, and they never have more than a single day off the entire mm -hmm. month of March and and all of April, at least leading up to the end of, end of the uh, regular season in April. So the Bruins are going to have a very busy schedule those two months. So what little bit of rest they're getting now, they should enjoy it. But anyway, three games between now and the next time we uh, podcast. We've got uh, Montreal again the third time in eight days uh, on Saturday night. And then they go back home and play the Devils on the 23rd. Uh, so that's after a three-day rest. And then they go to Ottawa on the 25th and play them there. So, And I think that's the last game of the season against Ottawa, although maybe not. I'm not sure. Yes. So, yeah, Bruins, pretty light schedule. Uh, definitely two games they should win and one game uh, against the Devils that, uh, that they could easily win if they continue to play as well as they have. Carolina, Carolina on the other hand, is coming out of their break. They've been on break. Uh, since the 15th, uh, today is officially the last day of their break. They Their net first game is tomorrow night against Detroit, and that's at Detroit. Then they come back home and play Vegas the next night, and then two days later they go out to Pittsburgh and play them, and then they go on the road to Montreal and play them on the 25th. So basically coming out of that break, they've got two in a row and three games in four nights and four games in six nights coming out of that break. So that's a pretty busy schedule for Carolina. Very busy. And I, I'll be surprised if they get points against Vegas because how Ve you know Vegas is playing so well. Uh, although they have been shown that they are somewhat beatable on the road. Um, they should beat Detroit. Uh, Pittsburgh is kind of a 50-50 for me, and then they should beat Montreal. But Carolina yeah. has shown that you don't know what you're going to get until until <laughs> until the game is well underway with yeah. them, what team shows up. That's true. And but. we went up there to Detroit, had the lead for most, if not, of, of the game. They came back, tied the game, and won it in the shootout. Yep. So you never know. Uh, Detroit plays good in that Little Caesars arena. They may come away with the win there. You never know. But it's it, it's safe to say Carolina needs to find a way to get five points out of these four games. Yeah, I agree. Yep. Minimum. In fact, if we come here next week, Wayne, and they only got two points out of there, that's... They're, they're, you know. We're going to stick a fork in them. <laughs> you think so? I don't know about... <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't know if I'll go that far, but boy, going to the All Star break, we can say that Carolina is not looking good. If they only get two points in four games, we're yeah, I'll be ready to stick a fork in them, yeah. especially with some of the teams on the. I mean, Montreal and Detroit, those are must wins. Carolina's better team than both of those teams. I agree. So, all right, and the Rangers. Have a busy week. Have a very busy week. We're going up against the vaunted Colorado Avalanche. <laughs> eight, eight game winning streak tomorrow in Colorado. Um, and I don't know, Wayne. I don't know. Uh, eight in a row is a lot of wins in a row. So we'll see. Uh, it's got to end sometime. It's got to end sometime. <laughs> uh, they're playing well, and we'll see. Uh, I, I know we have a lot of injuries, a lot of players, particularly Mark Stahl, uh, Kevin Hayes. Of course, now we know about Kevin Shattenkirk yep. and Chris Kreider are all out tomorrow. So we'll see. There's That's players four. stepping up. But quite a few quite a few guys from the Hartford Wolfpack up and playing for the uh, the uh, the Rangers uh, as we speak. So we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll see. The very next night, Sunday night, uh, they play in Los Angeles against the Kings at 1030 at night. Boy, that's a rough one. I don't know a game where I'm going to be able to stay in Denver, A game in Denver and then the next night in L.A.? In L.A. Ugh. So that, those are two tough ones. That's a fairly long flight, isn't it, Denver to L.A.? I don't know. You got me on that one. Uh, it's definitely not, you know, I, I'm sure it's over an hour. I don't know whether it's, it might be two hours, but uh, it's just guessing. Yeah, I would think uh, anything, I don't, anything, never, anything over two hours. I don't uh, Yeah, I'm. I've never flown out west, so I don't know the, the flight times yeah. between those cities. But it just seems to be in a long flight. But uh, that, that's what they've got on their t- uh, on their ticket right now. I, de- I, you know, stranger things have happened. They win both those games, boy. I'm going to be jumping up and down for joy. Yeah. Uh, then on the t- next Tuesday, the 23rd, they're still in Los Angeles, but they're taking on the Ducks at the Honda Center out there. So that that one. Um, I really don't know uh, that of, of any of those three California teams, maybe they can get a win against Anaheim. I don't know. But to close it out on on next Thursday, the 25th, they play uh, against San Jose, uh, the San Jose Sharks. So and then they, they're in their all star break. So those are four tough games. Yeah. Uh, and if they if they win two of those games. I'm I'm happy as I can be. I'll take that any day of the week. Uh, going into the playoffs, if they come out with four points out of those four games, I'm happy. You know. Um, yeah, that's a tough that's a tough road trip. Boston was fairly successful with it this year, but uh, yeah, that's a tough one. So we'll see how things go next. If we're if we're on air next Thursday night. Of course, he'll be talking before the San Jose game. If we're on air next Friday night, we'll have the results on those four games. Yeah, we're good. All right, and then of course you know this this it's it's going to be a much busier week on the ice than it has been the last couple of weeks because uh, as of I think as of tonight, uh, once we get through tonight, all the bye weeks are done for for the thirty one NHL teams. So everybody's back on the ice. So we're going to start seeing. I think tomorrow night we have a thirteen game night. Yeah. So twenty six out of thirty one teams have games tomorrow night. So that should be it's going to be fun. To see, here we go. We're in, we're we're, he, we're heading into the uh, last week before the All Star Game, so everybody's going to be pushing to get uh, as many points as they can going into that break. Because after that break is the stretch run. That's, that's right. That's when uh, that's when everything gets crazy busy and everyone starts really fighting for those last few playoff points. Well, that's right. So that's right. All right, let's move on to the minor league minute. And you have won about. Uh, a Hartford Wolfpack player, and I have one that uh, talks about uh, an interesting situation we had thanks to a snowstorm. Yeah. So which one do we want? <laughs> which one do we want to talk about? Well, you know, let me get mine out of the way because it's it's I I, I saw this article with with you, what that you have, and uh, it's interesting, and I, I think it's better than mine. So. Uh, All right. <laughs> mine specifically appeals to Rangers fans because they're going to know this player better than uh, unless you're an avid hockey fan, like Wayne, like you are. You're not going to you're not going to know a lot about Boo Nieves. But uh, I pulled an article out of the Hartford Current, uh, the January 18th by uh, John Altavia. Uh, it's an article entitled, entitled Back in Hartford, Booney Evis uh, is thankful for his time with the Rangers. 
Uh, and they pulled him, you know, uh, he's been, he's been up and down for two years now. Um, his rookie season in the NHL was last year. He was called up for one game, but he's a guy that uh, is high on the list for the Rangers as, uh, making the team one day and maybe he will, uh, you just don't know in the future too about Ranger, Ranger draft picks. Uh, but, um, Anyways, Boo Nieves came up this year and got a long stint to play with the Rangers. And so I wanted to read this article. After being recalled by the Rangers October 24th, Boo Nieves had no idea how long he'd stay in the NHL. After all, last season, the Rangers summoned him for just one game in November against Vancouver before returning him to the Wolfpack their AHL affiliate. Chance three, New York's second round pick in 2012, unpacked in his furnished apartment caddy corner to Madison Square Garden, determined to make a strong impression. Honestly, when I was re recalled, I tried not to think about, I tried not to think that far ahead, Nieves said Wednesday. My thoughts were entirely on wanting to make a good impression as quickly as I could. So far, the first couple of weeks, I made sure I was the hardest working guy in practice and in games. I wanted the Rangers to know how much I wanted uh, to be there and not uh, and not just on a vacation. In his first game against Arizona, he uh, recorded three assists. And during his 28 games, he scored one goal with eight assists. Despite averaging just over 10 minutes of ice time, his first NHL goal, NHL goal came December 5th in Pittsburgh. I'm not going to lie, Nieva said. On that bus ride to the arena that night, I was telling someone that I really wanted to score, not because I wanted to pad my stats, but because I wanted to show them I could play defense, penalty kill, and shoot the puck. As every game uh, passes and you don't score, you start thinking how much you wish you could find one. Then early in the first period, Matt Zuccarello came around the net. Uh, came around the net. People had been encouraging me to just shoot the puck. Matt's got the puck out front to me. I took a hard wrist shot, and it kind of slipped through a couple of bodies. I guess it was meant to be that way. It floated around everyone. It found the back of the net, and I felt like the weight of the world was off my shoulders for a hot second there. Ultimately, Nieves was returned to Hartford on Monday when the Rangers recalled veteran forward Peter Dack, Nieves said. Back to the basics which is never a bad thing. Nieves had only 23 shots on net and hadn't scored in his last 15 games. But at one point in early December, after he had played his first 131 minutes this season, he was the only player in the NHL who had played at least 10 games and hadn't been, the, uh, and hadn't been on the ice for a goal against. He's a big body, real strong, one-on-one, -on -one, and a real solid skater, Coach Alain Vigneault said of Nieves earlier this season. There's no doubt Boo is improving with every game. Every minute he plays, he gets more experience, and he's going to get better. The Evans' stay in New York was complicated by a severe case of food poisoning three games after his season debut and an injured hip suffered in Detroit. One of the highlights of his stay in New York was assisting fellow rookie Vinny Letary, who actually now has a starting role with the Rangers, was Hartford's leading scorer on his first NHL goal in his first NHL game on December 29th in Detroit. Eventually, the Rangers decided the Evans was still in need of some refinement, particularly when playing without the puck, when his positioning and aggressiveness seemed to sag. Maybe I started to think too offensively, Nieva said. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't brought up necessarily to score a goal every night, but I wanted to show that I could produce. So it's back to Hartford for one of the Rangers' top prospects, but this time with a real taste of what it's like to play in the NHL. It was a dream come true being out there for warm-ups and taking a glance around the garden. It's so incredible and electric, Nieva said. It's a cool feeling to know those people there are there to see you and your teammates and cheering you on, that all of New York City is behind you and anxious to see you win. They are such passionate sports fans, and honestly, it was just awesome. So my hat's off to Booney Evans. I hope he comes back up again and is able to make a bigger offensive presence. All right. For some, for some reason, Skype just stopped working on me, so... Uh... 
Steve dropped there, but yeah, we did catch the end of the uh, the article there. So, uh, so yeah, it's ju- it's it's just a kind of a day in the life of a minor leaguer there. Uh, in that, yes, case. it was because that's just one of hundreds and hundreds of stories of players that are just trying to make their way in the in the world of hockey and uh, and anytime you see stories like that you you're always pulling for those guys to try to to get up to the big time and stick there <laughs> and and stay there absolutely yep. so good yeah we have been having a few uh, Skype issues it's been a few times where Steve has kind of gone and Steve you'll hear it when you listen to the final podcast that I don't I don't know what it is. Well, we had a snowstorm this past week uh here in the Carolinas, so a lot not a lot of people going out and about at night right now because everybody's freaking out about, you know, all the water that's on the roads refreezing. So everybody this week has been in even after it snowed has been in a rush to get get their essentials, get home and stay there and and, and they don't leave their house until uh the next day when the sun comes up and melts all the ice that's, that has frozen onto the roads. So with that, I think a lot of Netflix is going on, which means the Internet is probably getting maxed out around here. (laughs) That's my only explanation as to why we've been having some connection issues tonight. And that's a good one. That might exactly be what it is. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. So good story there. Um, But mine is is also related to this snowstorm that we had, of course, um, on Tuesday night into Wednesday morning. Uh, well, depending on where you were in the state, some places in the state, it didn't start until Wednesday morning. Uh, but I believe in Charlotte, it started late Tuesday night. Uh, but they, uh, we had snow. And when we have snow in North Carolina, the entire state shuts down. And uh, okay. of course, Northerners like to make fun of it, myself included. But the reality is the, this state only gets one or two snowstorms a year that uh, where it snows enough to affect driving conditions. And this, because of that, the state is not prepared in terms of equipment to handle uh, accumulating snow on the roads. We just don't, you know, we don't have the fleet of, of plows and sand trucks and sand and salt and all that stuff that they have up north. It just, it simply doesn't exist down here because for yeah. the most part, you don't need it. Uh, so when it does snow, they basically shut everything down and wait until the snow melts, <laughs> essentially, right. before things, and and things don't truly get back to normal until all the snow is melted because... Uh, the the big thing that they fear af- even after it snows is it snows and then uh, during the day it melts, water's running across the roads, and then at night it gets cold again, it refreezes, and then you have black ice, which is... Yeah. Uh, and because we don't have the equipment and the salt and everything, they can't treat the roads for every spot of black ice around the state uh, because uh, I was watching the press conferences with the governor uh Early this week, and he made a he made a, a kind of a fun fact about North Carolina that in terms of lineal miles, total mileage of all the roads in North Carolina, North Carolina is second only to Texas in number of miles of roads uh, by for a state. So we have a we have a network of roads that is enormous. We've got a very small fleet of plow trucks, and that combination makes it so that uh, when it does snow, it's a net, it's a disaster. So, with that in mind, Charlotte Checkers, uh, I saw an article, um, it was posted on NHL.com, there's no author there. Somebody wrote it, obviously, but the author wasn't reported. Uh, but the Charlotte Checkers weren't going to get to let a little snow rain on their parade. After a winter storm dumped six inches of snow on Charlotte, North Carolina, I don't know how much you got, Steve, but we got 11 here at my house. Yeah. I we I, I didn't go out and measure it, but I know it was over. It was like uh, eight to ten inches. Yeah, we got more than the Greensboro area. Yeah, yeah. It seemed to be the the bulk of the snow was between uh, essentially somewhere around Burlington to about Durham was where the biggest yep. snowfalls uh, snowfall was, and a little bit north of where we are got even more than us. There were some that reported twelve or thirteen, but we were close to the max at my house at eleven. But anyway, in Charlotte, they got six. So the checkers of the American Hockey League decided to close the game to fans rather than reschedule their game against the Bridgeport Sound Tigers on Wednesday. And they made the best of the situation by tweeting through it. Now, the reason they did that is Bridgeport was already in town. They had played the night before uh, a game. So they would have had to, if they were going to reschedule the game, 
Bridgeport wasn't scheduled to come back to Charlotte the rest of the season, so Bridgeport would have had to make another trip down here, which for an NHL team is no big deal. You know, everybody makes millions of dollars there, but minor league hockey, a flight for an entire team is, is expensive, especially for only one game. So they figured while the Bridgeport Sound Tigers are in town... And instead of making them come back down here again at some other point in the season, which is a huge expense to a minor league team, they decided to go ahead and play the game anyway. But they didn't want fans coming to the game because of how dangerous the roads were. So they closed the game to the public and they played in front of zero fans. Mm. So only a few essential team employees came to work. So they were doing any and all jobs that needed to be done. And there were various tweets that went, uh, it, it were going on throughout the game. So a couple of the tweets uh, from the checkers. We're short staff for tonight's hashtag behind closed doors two game. So we had to get creative. And then the next tweet. Ticket sales staff are now the checkmates. The checkmates are like the uh, the cheerleaders. The, 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 well, it's, it's pretty much all female cheerleaders that go out and do dances and stuff between periods. Uh, and and of course they shovel the they shovel the the during the commercial breaks they shovel the uh, the rink, like kind of like what they do in the NHL. Okay, yeah. well the checkmates were now ticket sales staff, <laughs> <laughs> so the checkmates obviously didn't go to the game. Uh, the season ticket staff uh, are now the checkmates. Okay, our finance guy is now our PA announcer. Our uh, corporate sales guy is running the video board. Our merchandise manager is running a camera. <laughs> yeah. And finally, our chief operating officer is now the DJ. Things are weird. <laughs> and then it said hashtag behind closed doors too. And of course, that it came with accompanying pictures <laughs> on everything. <laughs> so the mascot Chubby was not one of the essential employees. So they came up with a pretty good substitute. And they used a, co- a computer-generated huge bear that they they superimposed over the over the uh, the online because they online stream the game for those who have like the uh, uh, the NHL they have a similar package that what the NHL has for the American Hockey League so you can watch the game online uh, but they superimposed a, a computer-generated dancing bear on top of it and the thing was huge he was ha- <laughs> the 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 space from the ice to the scoreboard that bear was literally half take up half that distance so he's probably 15 15 foot tall uh dancing computerized bear so and then the tweet goes out saying chubby couldn't make it but i think we found a temporary replacement and then and then the article goes on until that is they dusted off chubby's costume and put it on the team's corporate servicing specialist (laughs) <laughs> and then it said chubby is here just kidding it's our corporate servicing specialist she's trying <laughs> <laughs> and then of course when it was time for player rituals this one lacked a little enthusiasm but kudos to goalie jeremy smith for staying in the spirit of things and then they show a video of the players coming out the, the players come out of their dressing room and they go through like a lounge area where the fans can watch them walk by if you if you look at it there's a bunch of tables and chairs on both sides of the of the hallway that that the checkers come out of their locker room and head towards the ice well jeremy smith the goalie comes out and he's like fake high-fiving the fans as he's walking by he's like putting his hands out like he's high-fiving but he's high-fiving nobody (laughs) and then uh and then it said come puck drop the cup the crowd went wild and then in parentheses the crowd did not go wild (laughs) Intermission games didn't really go as go as well as they they have their normal six thousand fans in attendance. And then, then they tweeted out during the intermission: Would anybody like to play an intermission game? <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag awkward silence. <laughs> I guess nobody bought poutine in Charlotte that yeah, night. Yeah, nobody. <laughs> that's right. Nobody bought. <laughs> they do sell poutine there. So. <laughs> So, and of course, the best way to hype up a non-existent crowd, Cotton Eye Joe, hands down. They were playing that <laughs> between one of the whistles. And then this, and then it shows they even tried the kiss cam, but sadly it lacked the smooches we expect to warm our hearts. And of course, they show the kiss cam just showing a bunch of empty seats around the arena. In in the end, though, the checkers ended up winning the game 4-3 to three, and everyone stayed safe in the process. This was the second time the checkers played in an empty arena because of bad weather. They did the same back on January 22nd, 2016, 
But if they were ever have to do it again, we know there will be no shortage of fun. So essentially, it must have been strange to play a game in front of nobody. <laughs> but, you know, those games, they, they say, and it takes an act of God to stop. It has to be a, just a horrible blizzard to stop yeah. a hockey game. Yeah. Well, and, and in the case of minor leagues where, where they were already there, the, the Bridgeport yeah. team, uh, they had already played a night before. You know, it, it actually made more sense for them to just go ahead and play the game than to because, you know, the, the teams were there. The 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 officials were there because they used the same officials for the two consecutive nights. Uh, they might as well just go ahead and just get the game played, and and just for the safety of the fans, they didn't want anybody getting hurt trying to get to the game. They just said, you know what, we're gonna play in front of nobody, and if you had a ticket for that game, just you know bring it in, or you know you can get a, either a refund or. Uh, free tickets to another game rather right. than rather than risk people trying to get to the game because I can't imagine what it would have been like trying to get all those fans in <laughs> with with the roads the way they were. It would have been a nightmare for all the uh, all the uh, the traffic because they use a lot of police and sheriff to handle the traffic around that arena. We've experienced that one firsthand. So absolutely, that's <laughs> in right downtown. Yep. So that was mine minor league minute all That's right a very we, good one too and i read that article i laughed that, that was very <laughs> good because we were just there yep and seeing chubby dancing in the in the <laughs> that was really funny all right all right let's quickly get through the college hockey stuff um because it was uh i wasn't a well it was a busy week but i just didn't pay attention to it that much but um first and foremost university of maine uh they had three games last week unusual that they have more than two uh they had they lost five to three twice at Northeastern, and then they came back home for their first home game since mid-December and got a 3-1 win versus UMass. But because of the two losses to Northeastern, UMass is not a very good team. Uh, they ended up dropping from 18th down to 22nd in the pairwise and are now back as an unranked team. Uh, this weekend, they've got a UNH twice at home. Uh, UNH is also unranked. But they're kind of sitting right around where Maine is, just outside the ranked uh, area. So maybe they'll get some with with a pair of wins there. They can they might be able to get back into the to the uh, the rankings again. Um, but as far as um, games going on, I didn't see anything that was earth shattering. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the games uh, that uh, went on. Just safe to say there was nothing huge and explosive really to talk about college hockey we're heading into the meat of the college hockey season where it's mostly uh, conference games at this point there the the uh, non-conference schedule is getting down to a bare minimum at this point so um so if you're if you're a fan of college hockey you're probably aware of this and you're following your favorite conference uh, much closer than you had been earlier in the year now, as far as the pairwise rankings are concerned, right now in the 16th spot in the pairwise, uh, and I'm waiting for it to pull up here, you've got Michigan. And above them, in, uh, tied for 14th, are both Minnesota Duluth and Minnesota. Uh, Northeastern is at 13. Penn State is number 12. Number 11 is Omaha. Number 10 is North Dakota. Number 9 is Providence. Number 8, Minnesota. Number 7, Mich Western Michigan. Number six is Denver. Number five, Ohio State. Number four, Cornell. Number three, St. Cloud State. Number two, Clarkson. And number one, uh, again, this week is Notre Dame. So the uh, pairwise rankings continues to be very uh, Western heavy this time around. Mm -hmm. Of course, that swings back and forth from year to year, depending on um, you know various factors. But <laughs> but this year it seems like the uh, the best teams, for the most part, top to bottom, are out West right now. So anyway, that's... All there is for college hockey for this week. So that leaves us now with the picks of the week. And we've kind of already gone through yours. Was yours yes. uh, Andrew Cogliano talking about his suspension and how kind of, um, you know, well, we went over that if you listen to it early in the show. So let's move on to mine. And I picked this one because it kind of struck home a little bit for me. Uh, it was an article I found on NHL.com by David McCarthy. Uh, who's an NHL dot com correspondent talking about Patrick Marlowe keeping his family tradition alive with a backyard rink and the photo of the rink. If you haven't seen it, there's a link to the in the show notes um, to the article is only an NHL player or a guy with an NHL player's salary 
could put up a rink like this. This rink is oh, really, yeah. really nice. Better than any Dude. outdoor rink that I've ever played in, that's for sure. But anyway, yeah. the article reads as follows. Toronto Maple Leafs forward Patrick Marlowe knew exactly what he wanted to give his four sons for Christmas this year. Growing up in Aneroid, Saskatchewan, Marlowe fell in love with playing hockey on a frozen pond near his home, spending hours skating with his older brother Richard and older sister Denise. Living in Northern California during his 19 seasons with the Sharks, He never had the chance to skate outdoors. But after signing with the Maple Leafs on July 2nd, moving his family to Toronto, Marlowe finally could pass on one of his most cherished childhood memories to his kids. While he and his wife, Christina, and four sons, Landon, who's 11, Brody, who's 8, Jagger, who's 6, and Caleb, who's 3, visited family in California during the Christmas break, Marlowe had a contractor install an ice rink, complete with boards, blue lines, and a Maple Leafs logo at center ice in the yard of his Toronto home. Selfishly, it was because of my childhood, Marlowe said. I wanted to give it to them and let them have that experience as well. For me, growing up in Saskatchewan, we we had a pond that we clean off in the winter and skate on, and I thought that was pretty cool. Being up here in Toronto in the snow and the cold, I thought it'd be a great opportunity for the kids to skate whenever they wanted. Marlowe said he and, and Christina did their best to keep the rink a secret until showing their sons a picture of it on Christmas. Not surprisingly, they couldn't wait to get back home. Since returning to Toronto, the boys ha- head right to the rink as soon as they get out of school. We didn't really tell them about it, and then on Christmas we showed them a picture, and they were pretty pumped, Marlowe said. They loved it. They couldn't wait to get back on the plane and get on the ice. They've definitely got the use of it, got the use out of it so far. Marlo said he's been on the rink a few times, mostly to help three year old Caleb, who's learning to skate, but so far he has stayed out of the games. I think my wife's going to be one of the the one who's out there more than me, he said. Hopefully our three year old will start picking it up pretty quick. We got one of those push things so when you're learning to skate for him, but he just seems to want to watch his brothers right now. And uh just a side note, those push things basically it's, it's it's essentially you know you you see elderly and and injured people have walkers mm-hmm. you know with with wheels and and they just mm-hmm. use it to that's basically they essentially use those on the ice to help people learn how to skate. Oh, wow. <clears throat> Marlowe said his three older boys have behaved themselves on the ice, which is a good thing since there are no penalty boxes on the rink. <laughs> I guess they're used to playing in the basement, so they're just carrying it outdoors, Marlo said. I'm just happy to see them having fun, seeing them playing with each other, and spending hours out there. Kind of gives mom a break. Marlo said he's been impressed with how eager his sons have been to take on the responsibility of maintaining the rink themselves, but wondered why that same desire has not extended to other chores around the house. It's nice seeing my kids going out there when there's snow to shovel it off, Marlo said. I can't get them to pick up clothes off the floor, but they'll go shovel the snow. (laughs) <laughs> so just an in- interesting article that kind of rang home for me because i grew up in northern vermont and um the town that i lived in was a, was an old paper mill town um and on the mill property the mill provided the, the land uh they provided the warming shack and <clears throat> and essentially it was all volunteers who maintained it but uh we had a rink and it was literally just down the street from I could see the ice I when I walked home from school I could look down the rink as I'm walking down the street towards my house from from the school uh essentially from the school I could look down the end of the street it was just beyond that this rink Hmm. and uh I would basically the winters for me from about the age of eight or nine all the way up until pretty much that whole um um club i guess it was it was considered an outing club is what they call themselves um the outing club kind of disbanded and and the insurance company started charging way too much and and it just became just too much to maintain the rink after a while so at some point in my high school years they stopped putting the ice down every year which is a shame because now the rink is gone the shack is gone all that's left is the concrete pad where the where the shack once stood <clears throat> but anyway I grew up with a rink right down the street from my house. It was a public rink, but it was almost full size, almost NHL size. Not quite as long, but it was as wide as an NHL rink. And uh, every day I'd walk home from school from uh, because the school was within walking distance. I'd walk home from school. As I'm walking down the street, I'd look down the end of the street, see if there's anybody down there. If there was anybody down there or even if there wasn't. 
I'd get home from school, drop my school bag, grab my stick and, and skates, and, and we did the old thing where you put your, put your stick through the through the hole, you know, the, the bottom of the skates the, the, where the blade is, there's a hole there. You put your <coughs> stick through the hole, throw it over your shoulder, so you got your stick, your skates hanging off your stick, uh, and you, you're carrying it down, you know, one-handed down the eye, or down the, just grab my, you know, drop off my, my school stuff, grab my skates and stick, and out the door I went, and <laughs> my parents wouldn't see me again until it got dark. <laughs> that was my every that was my everyday life for two months a year because yeah. that's about how long we would have ice from about uh, depending on the the year we'd have ice from right just after Christmas until uh, about the first week of March down at that rink and I lived at that place lived at that place in the winter time <laughs> and yeah those are good old days so when oh, I saw yeah. this article I'm like yep that was my life when I was a kid right there plus it's a beautiful rink and it's and it's where and it's you know. That rink that I grew up on, it's where I learned to play, and and uh, it's where I learned to love the game. So yeah, so yeah, this one, this one struck a little home for me. <laughs> but yeah, the the if that's got, a great art. You've got to you've got to see that rink if if you want to see what a beautiful outdoor. I mean, it basically it's it's NHL quality boards, really, just yeah. on a, just on a smaller scale. That rink doesn't look much more than a, you know probably fifty feet wide by maybe a hundred feet long. Mm -hmm. At best, so so it's a small rink and no glass, just boards. But yeah, interesting. But I gotta I gotta nag him a little bit though. He didn't build it himself. He had a contractor do it. I saw that. I'm <laughs> like, oh yeah. <laughs> and who knows? It may have refrigeration, which will keep it so when they have a warm spell, uh, the ice might stay fine. But yeah, we would do the thing when I was growing up. You know, where you go down there and play all afternoon, and then and of course when I was old enough. Uh, my dad was part of the flooding crew, so when I was old enough, I would go down there with them. And they were, if I didn't have school the next day, we would. There would be a lot of long nights there where we would, um, you know, after all the, you know, you'd have public skating and you'd have a little bit of uh, hockey time and 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 sometimes hockey games on that rink. Well, when all the public would go home, then the flooding crew would come, and we would, uh, of course, scrape the ice. And then we'd start flooding. And depending on how mm -hmm. cold it was, if we had a real cold night, if it was like 10 below or something, we'd stay down at the rink. One of the guys would bring a TV and we'd, you know, watch TV in between. And, uh, you know, we would stay there till three, four in the morning, just flooding. You know, you'd, you'd, yeah. you'd go out on the ice, you'd flood a coat of water down because in the early part of the season where you're trying to build up the thickness of the ice, you want to put a lot of coats of ice and you have to put it down in thin, thin coats. Because if you put it down too thick, it would puddle, and then you'd get shell ice, and that's no good. So you put it down in thin coats and then build it up over time. Well, mm -hmm. there were there were a lot of nights if I didn't have school the next day. We'd start flooding at 8. We wouldn't leave there till about 4 in the morning. And we'd, we'd do about one flood an hour if it was cold enough. And it would take, wow. us, about, it would take us about 20 minutes to flood the ice. And then we'd go inside, and the sh warming shack was basically heated by a single wood stove uh, that was basically a steel barrel laid down on its side, and they cut the end out and 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 uh, weld in a, a door, and we would you know throw the wood inside the barrel, and they'd fire that thing up so hot that the barrel would start to glow. <laughs> it would you'd shut wow. the lights off, and you'd see the barrel glowing orange. <laughs> it was the craziest <laughs> thing. And we'd get off the ice after flooding. Of course, our our mittens and gloves were because you get you get the ice or the water on it, but the ice would and you, and your gloves are frozen solid, and you can barely move them by the time you're done flooding. You go in, you just lay the gloves down on the stove, and tss, they'd steam, and you see the steam come up, and you and you know leave them on there a few minutes, turn them over, and then they'd steam and and you know boil away all the water and then and then you just hang them up on a on a wire that we had set up over the stove uh and then you know just let them dry until the next time we go out an hour later so a lot a lot of time was spent on that outdoor ice <laughs> it's good man but it's a lot of great fun memories yep so well good all right well that's it for our show for this week another close to two hour show <laughs> <laughs> You but, close by week, there's a lot to talk about. Well, and not only that, the reason our shows end up being so long is, is uh, we've been getting a lot of feedback lately, and, and one of the feedback things that I've been getting, that I've been seeing, is the, the folks that are giving us feedback are um, telling us that they don't want to just hear the news from us. They want to hear what we think of the news. They want our insight. 
So we've been right. spending a little bit more time on each article that we're talking about uh, in order to do that because that's that's essentially what our listeners are looking for. So because um, you know everybody can find the news by just going you know on online, they can read the news, but. But to, to hear what our insight is is why most people listen to us. So that's what we're trying to do. So, But if you do want to give us feedback, you certainly can. You can uh, tweet me. I'm at Wayne Halley 9 and Steve is at sball504man. Or you can send us an uh, email at feedback at thehockeynuts.com. And, uh, you, you know, of course, you can reach us through our Facebook page at facebook.com slash thehockeynuts. Our YouTube channel can be reached at HockeyNuts.com slash YouTube. And, of course, we live stream the recording of our podcast each week on YouTube. So you can watch it as we make it, or you can wait for us to uh, put it together and send it out to your favorite podcast catcher, which uh, basically we can be found anywhere podcasts are found. No need to list all the places there. Everybody knows them by now. (laughs) So with that, we'll go ahead and end the show for another week. And we will uh, talk to you next week, Steve. Have a good week, Wayne. Good Uh, to talk to you again. All right, you too.